Good afternoon. I am Rebecca Mark, Director of the Institute for Women's Leadership at Rutgers University. I am honored to welcome Rutgers faculty, staff, students, alumni, community partners, and all our friends nationally and internationally who have joined us for the Institute for Women's Leadership Consortium Symposium, Making Care Count, Care Work, Gender, and COVID-19. It is my great pleasure to introduce Francine Conway, Provost and Executive Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at Rutgers University, New Brunswick, to provide our welcome. Dr. Conway, a distinguished professor and an award-winning scholar and clinical psychologist, is recognized for her work in child psychopathology. She previously served as the Dean of the Graduate School of Applied and Professional Psychology at Rutgers University, New Brunswick from 2016 to 2020. As Dean, she led the school's nationally recognized research and service centers, Rutgers Center of Alcohol and Substance Use Studies, Douglas Developmental Disability Center, and the Rutgers Center for Adult Autism Services. Dr. Conway has provided leadership for schools and professional psychology programs through the National Council of Schools and Programs of Professional Psychology. It is my great privilege to welcome Provost Francine Conway. Thank you, Dr. Mark, for that wonderful welcome. And thank you everyone for joining this symposium today. The pandemic is raising new gender equity issues and highlighting existing inequities. Women in particular are being adversely impacted as they disproportionately carry the burden of caregiving and work in care industries that have been crippled by the pandemic. We're seeing these adverse impacts in higher education where families prioritize their caregiving responsibilities ahead of making progress towards their academic and career goals. At Rutgers, we're having conversations around the ways in which we can recognize and address these negative COVID impacts. In addition to updating university policies around promotion and tenure, the academic leadership in New Brunswick is collaborating with my office to provide grants to faculty members whose scholarly productivity has suffered due to COVID. Now, given the impacts of COVID-19 pandemic and the issues around care and gender and racial injustice, these are critical now more than ever. So thank you, Dr. Mark, for your leadership in making this day possible. And thank you to all our speakers and guests for engaging in these important conversations. Because while we prepare our buildings and our grounds to receive back our community to return to work, it's important to recognize the people who are gonna be in those spaces. And this conversation today really gets to the heart of who we are, who the people are, and the care and concern that we should have uh, for each other. So thank you for leading this effort. Welcome everyone, and I wish you a very successful day today. Thank you, Francine, for those words and setting us clearly in the field of higher education. I will begin my introduction now. It has been over a year of heart numbing sadness and desperation, watching the number of COVID deaths rise exponentially. 569,402 in the United States as of today. Three million individuals have succumbed to this global health crisis worldwide. Black, indigenous, and people of color have lost grandparents, parents, friends, sons and daughters at disproportionately higher rates. And while we reel from COVID, the consequences of America's neglect of systemic racism have sparked a long overdue racial reckoning. Two days ago, we heard the judge read, guilty, guilty, guilty. 
the words echoing to our core. We have watched as women trapped in homes experience skyrocketing domestic violence, juggled impossible responsibilities, teaching their children, caring for elderly parents, and finding themselves stretched to the breaking point. This is the harvest of carelessness, valuing gain and individual success over compassion, empathy, and care. There are so many synonyms for care. Pay attention, tend, watch, nurture, protect, foster, treasure, nurse, mother, attend. When a society has a hundred words for snow, it is because they live in a cold climate and value the nuances of snow. Today is the Institute for Women's Leadership Consortium's gathering to value the nuances of care. We began this symposium with an extraordinary painting by Jordan Castile, a professor of painting at Rutgers Newark of a masked mother and child sitting on a subway holding each other. When a society fails, we turn to our artists for vision and reflection. Thank you, Jordan, for your generosity in sharing your painting, Royal, with us today. As we navigate the months ahead, as we remove our masks, let us reveal faces of radical compassion. It is my great honor at this time to introduce my colleague, Deb Lancaster. She is the moderator of the first conversation, Women's Power and Resilience, organizing for care from the local to the national. Deb Lancaster is the executive director of the Center for Women in Work, committed to advancing research, education, and programming that promotes economic and social equity and justice for women, their families, and communities. Recently, the center partnered with New Jersey affiliates of the National Domestic Workers Alliance, documenting the working conditions of domestic workers. CWW is also conducting research exploring the lived experiences and effects of unpredictable scheduling on women workers and their families and assessing New Jersey's paid family leave policy. Prior to joining Rutgers, Deb served for over 10 years on the leadership team of the New Jersey Department of Children and Families, leading transformation and systems change in the human service arena. Deborah began her career as a union organizer with visions of organizing childcare workers. She has a master's degree in labor and employment relations from Rutgers University. Welcome, Deb. Thank you so much for Rebecca and to the IWL team for bringing us all here together today. I also wanna thank the team at the Center for Women in Work and just say that the support and understanding and perseverance of my Rutgers colleagues um, over the past year has certainly contributed to my own stores of resilience um, and has kept, it, kept them accessible. And for that, I'm so grateful. Um, for 26 years, the Center for Women in Work has been working on efforts to understand in advance how paid and unpaid care work fits into our economic, political, and social landscape. And here's what we know. Care work is essential work. It was so before the pandemic and will continue to be long after. Care work is intimate and messy. It's physically demanding and emotionally draining. It can be meaningful and rewarding, lonely and traumatizing. Care work is skilled work. It helps raise our future, comforts our sick, and helps us take care of some of our most ba basic needs when we're not able to. It helps us live, it helps us die, and care labor is the hidden backbone of our economy and our society. Paid care workers, <clears throat> including home health aides, nursing assistants, child care workers, and direct service workers are some of the lowest paid workers in our economy. For example, here in New Jersey, um, a wealthy state, home health aides annual salaries range from about $23,000 to $25,000 annually. Like many undervalued jobs, this one is done disproportionately by women and people of color. 95% of home health aides in New Jersey are women, more than half immigrants, and almost 70% are Black or Latina. 
We also know that as a nation, we lag behind in the ability for workers to access paid leave to care for themselves or a loved one in their time of need, whether that be a birth of a child or an illness of a loved one or a disruption caused by a global pandemic. And even in states that have passed legislation, like New Jersey, access and the ability to take leave remains unequal and uneven, especially among workers with the least status and power. Today, I'm super excited to hear from each of our panelists about their reflections on the intersection of care work, the current moment, and their own work, which includes developing women's leadership and social movements, raising standards in the care work industry, and working with marginalized communities on the ground to achieve community health and well being. We have a scholar, an attorney, and a healthcare leader with us today, each also an organizer, an advocate and an activist. Dr. Cherie Davis Faulkner, a native Atlantan and interdisciplinary scholar activist is the associate director of the Center for Innovation and Worker Organization and an assistant professor of professional practice with the Labor Studies Employment Relations Department here at Rutgers University in the School of Management and Labor Relations um, and also my colleague. She co-directs the National Will and Power, which is Women Innovating Labor Leadership Program, a bold, ambitious initiative to identify, nurture, train, and convene a new generation of women labor leaders. She has been a member of the Crunk Feminist Collective since 2009 and currently serves on the board of the National Black Workers Center and is a steering committee of steering, steering committee member of the Advancing Black Strategists Initiative. Dr. Davis completed her doctorate in American Studies at Emory University and holds degrees from Ohio State University and Spelman College as well. Rocio Alejandra Avia is the National Domestic Worker Alliance's Senior Employment Law Council and State Policy Director. She is the daughter of Mexican immigrants and a community activist from San Francisco, California. She has over 14 years of experience as a workers' rights attorney representing low-wage immigrant workers, including domestic workers, day laborers, restaurant workers, and janitors. Prior to NDWA, she was a senior fellow at the Women's Employment Rights Clinic of the Golden Gate School of Law and co-director of La Raza Centro Legal's Workers' Rights Program in San Francisco. She is a graduate of Golden Gate University School of Law and, uh, and the University of uh, California, Santa Cruz. And finally, Miriam Mursad has been the director of the Robert Wood Johnson Barnabas Health System, University Hospital Community Health Promotion Program for the past 29 years. I find that nearly impossible, Miriam. Um, in this role, she is responsible for the coordination of accessible quality preventative healthcare services and educational programs for communities in Middlesex County, New Jersey. I am a proud Middlesex County resident right next door to New Brunswick. She partners with houses of worship, health institutions, and community-based organizations in the design and implementation of culturally appropriate community-wide health promotion initiatives. She's received numerous awards for her contributions toward improving the quality of life quality of lives of our residents and holds degrees from the University of Puerto Rico and Rutgers University. Thank you all for being here. Um, we are going to open the discussion with a question for each of you so that you can introduce your work and how it intersects with care work and how the pandemic has impacted what you were focused on prior to the pandemic. And Miriam, we were gonna start with you. Um, Let's see, where did she go? Right there. <laughs> yes, yes. Hi, hi all, thank you for the invitation. And yes, it's been gonna be actually 30 years this year, um, but there's no dull moment here when you do work in the community. Every day is a new challenge and it's a new way of doing life, right? So this has been my journey here. Um, and I'm very excited for this opportunity as I reflected on this question, you know, I, I, am, um, I am a result of care work in this city, right? I, I came from Puerto Rico. I, I went to school here at Rutgers for uh, the graduate program at La in labor studies. And I remember I had to get a job right away and I went, ended up being a security guard in one of the senior buildings here. And it was a network of seniors, of Latino seniors in that building that recommended me for my first job in this city. And 
that's that's you know that's that's the 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 beauty of care work you know these ladies were taking care of me and their families um so i wanted to highlight that that's the way i started this work in this community and those connections and that network has been essential in the work that i do so i'm director for community health um, my role is to improve access to preventive primary care information education for the vulnerable communities that we serve, especially here in the city of New Brunswick. Um, we do this through aggressive community outreach and the formation of community partnerships. Um, we have a model of using community health workers or promotoras, how we call them here, um, to engage residents in identifying needs and putting programs together um, to um, address these health needs. And as, as, as we define community health promoters, those are your care workers here in the community, right? They, they are from this community. They go through the same issues that many of our community residents go through. Um, but they have found a way to, to give back, to have a meaningful experience here, not just being immigrants and trying to do better for you know, themselves and the families that they left behind. Um, this work also has given, like you were mentioning, casework, you know, a care work can also be meaningful for, for many people. Um, how I, how we, we, you know, it, it was because of them that we survived this issue of, of COVID in our office, right? It was because of their contacts. It was because of their resiliency that we were able to continue to provide services in the community. They had the connections at the right time. They had the trust of the people at the right time. Um, and so, so through the pandemic, um, they were able to organize the food drive, they were able to organize um, the cleaning supplies that people identifying who didn't have medication and who we needed to serve um, during critical, critical times, how people could quarantine, which was a big issue in this community, and also raising their boys so the hospital knew um, what were the specific issues is in this community, how we needed to raise funds to make sure that we have places for people to quarantine, because it's, it's not, it, was, it was very difficult when I translated those first discharge instructions that said, you know, go home and quarantine. I knew right away that we were going to be into a lot of trouble, right? Because our people didn't have a thermometer to, um, they didn't have... Um, cleaning supplies because everybody else went and bought everything and they didn't have that kind of money so the promotoras those care workers here were essential in making sure that we were getting to the most needy families um, in the city and and they were able to volunteer at the testing sites and also push for the testing sites to be here where people could walk to because the initial testing sites were not in a place that there was even public transportation. Um, so they were able to push for those things to be here in the city that they could volunteer at and translate and make people comfortable um, about giving their information when they went in. Also being the same people that you know were able to um, give them their results and trace them and now working in the vaccine clinics. So you see that continuity of that care work. Um, I don't wanna take more time. I know that other people <laughs> wanna say other things, but you know, that is the intersection between the work that I do and care work in this city. Oh, thank you for getting us uh, started, Miriam. And that work is really important. Um, and uh, yeah, those early days, and, and I say this just because I live right next to New Brunswick, um, you know, the, the supplies were low and, you know, folks, you know, the shelves were empty and uh, there was no place to quarantine for, for many, many people. Um, uh, Rocio, um, would you like to go next? Sure. Um, yeah, I was, you know, listening to your story, Miriam, and it's very inspiring. Um, so I, I come to this work um, of care from a personal um, standpoint. My mom was an immigrant and her first job was as a house cleaner, eventually became a janitor and was able to become a union member in San Francisco at Local 87. 
And I, through my experience, I've been able to see the difference in what it, it had an, an impact in her life, being able to um, eventually have some benefits as a union member and what her experience was as, as a house cleaner in her early years as, a, as an American woman. And that experience really kind of shaped my, my trajectory. And um, I chose uh, the field of employment law mostly due to my own immigrant experience as, as a child of, um, of a house cleaner. Now um, at the Alliance, um, most of my work and in the last year and a half really has been to focus on addressing those gaps, right? And these are gaps, as you pointed out, uh, Deborah, that were there pre-pandemic, but that we've uh, seen exasperate in the community in the early uh, days when the shutdowns happened, um, we were getting calls constantly. We weren't able to have enough membership meetings, which were typically once a week. Um, for those of you who not know about the Alliance, um, the Alliance has over 60 affiliates across the country. Um, we were founded in 2007 and since then, um, in my role has been to raise standards for domestic workers in state and local policy. Um, and this past year, um, those uh, considerations were fully put up in, in bare display about the gaps and predominantly in the area of loss of wages. Um, our members are predominantly workers who are working um, informally, who are not eligible for unemployment insurance, who even if they are in states like New Jersey that has uh, paid sick time, unfortunately um, aren't able to reach the eligibility hours due to the nature of the work, which is mostly that have, that means that they have multiple employers and aren't able to meet the criteria that is necessary. Um, the membership has also been very clear about issues regarding health and safety. Um, you know, uh, homes are workplaces and the narrative about what was a workplace, an essential workplace, was really the hospital or the supermarket or other uh, places that we all as a community need and rely. And most people didn't think of the home as a place where care was already happening, right? Whether it was a person that needed home care and they were seeking a home care worker coming into their home or they needed obviously childcare um, and um, other uh, maintenance in their home, including running errands. While most of that in the first couple of months uh, did pause to some extent in the house cleaning industry, the home care and nanny work did not. And so what I saw from a legal standpoint and policy is that while um, essential workers were defined in a certain way for domestic workers, even if we were referred to as essential workers, the law didn't necessarily protect and extend the same protections that the same workers and employers that were they were supporting at home had coverage and protection. So this, this past year really has been for us to really pivot on what it means to have health and safety in the private household, reinforcing the need to expand that um, the, the definition, but also to uh, make employers and the community at large understand that if there weren't specific uh, PPE um, safeguards for workers that included domestic workers, the pandemic was not going to be addressed comprehensively because workers were coming in and out. And in some cases were asked to stay and become live-in workers so that they could avoid having to take the subway or avoid getting in you know, Uber, uh, Lyft, um, so that the risk factor in bringing the virus into their homes was, was minimized. 
Um, however, workers were not compensated more for that. They were not given the, the money to take the Lyft and Uber or to buy their own PPE. And so um, I have been focused in understanding how to change that. And most recently, we have focused on what is the, the distribution of the vaccine, right? What does equity mean? For, for women of color, for low-wage workers, for immigrant women um, in, in places where they have a very hard time figuring out how to get the vaccine, mostly because of the way that people are being asked to register and access it, which relies on technology, on certain um, level of literacy and ability to know how to ask for help. And so our New York chapter, our Philadelphia chapter, our DC chapter, and in California have really pivoted to be able to get people on board and um, assist them in understanding how to be vaccinated and figuring out a way to make sure that everybody um, has access to it. In most cases, many employers have required that domestic workers before continuing to work for them, that they prove that they've been vaccinated, which that's a separate issue about whether or not that's even legal. Um, but most domestic workers want to be vaccinated. They want to be, um, they want to protect themselves. They want to protect their family and they want to protect the, the people that are hiring them. The problem is whether they have access to it and whether or not the, the uh, requirement of vaccination um, can be used as a, as a pretext for retaliation for other, um, other reasons. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Davis. It's Carmen Cherie. Um, <laughs> hi, everyone. Um, I, I, I'm really happy to be here, and I really appreciate you creating a space for this, um, um, Deborah, um, and also being able to be here with you, Rocio and Miriam. Um, I, you know, in many ways, because I work at a national level, I, I often feel like one step removed from, from what's happening. Um, I am the Associate Director at the Center for Innovation and Worker Organization, and I want to explain that the center, our mission is to promote strong worker and community organizations to shift the balance of power towards greater equity in our economy and our society. So I want to put that out there. Um, I specifically co-direct a program called Will Empower, which is Women Innovating Labor Leadership. Uh, I've been doing this for the past almost four years. Um, and one of the things that happened when the pandemic hit is that we were rounding out our cohort of women labor leaders um, from across the country, our executive leadership cohort. Um, and one of the things that I learned very quickly is that it is important to have a network um, because in the moment where we were gearing up for our last retreat and everything started to shut down, um, we had a labor leader in, in um, uh, Pacific Northwest, who was able to say, here's what's happening in Washington. This is what we're seeing on the ground. These are the types of things that um, have happened just in a week. Um, and, and having her get on the phone with all of the folks in the cohort and give a kind of a rundown of what was happening created the opportunity for these women leaders to be able to give suggestions or start thinking consciously, if this thing happens in this state, what's going to happen? If this thing happens in my city, what's going to happen? And so the ability to move information quickly um, uh, so that it could actually allow for scenario planning and, and, and really put people into action to take seriously what was going on mattered. Um, this is a cohort of predominantly women of color. This is a cohort that includes not only labor leaders, union leaders, but also worker center leaders and community-based organization leaders. We identify labor expansively. And so that means that the way that we started to respond, you know, in some ways, uh, one of the value of having a labor union is that they can often activate very quickly and move resources to be able to support their members. The challenge is, is when folks are not organized or not in within an organization, they either don't get information and they don't have the opportunity to, 
to benefit from those kinds of resources. And this is where worker centers and community-based organizations come into play. And so what we saw was you know, development of um, mutual aid um, funds. Um, be, you know, funders reaching out to us saying, we're trying to get money to the field. How do we do this? Who's set up? Who's ready to go? We had an organization and networks that were preparing, okay, we see that the stimulus is going to do the thing that it often does and leave our folks out. And predominantly women and people of color were the ones who were being left out. And so they started pooling funds to be able to provide resources to people who are identified as essential but don't fall underneath um, uh, uh, the categories. And quite frankly, I wanna remind us that last year we were under a very different administration that was not supportive. And so there were very many people who were left out intentionally as a way of weaponizing what, um, what, what it means to have uh, a, a, a security net. And so to, to, to be able to move information quickly, to be able to share strategies um, to strategize together and to recognize that they didn't all have to have the answers. Like, so for me, I'm already thinking that when we talk about care infrastructure um, and, and putting in place the ability for these types of things to happen um, broadly, that what I got to see was what happens when you already have an infrastructure that has a care ethic, that means that people are working with each other and for each other across organization, across the country um, with the understanding that we have to take care of our people, right? We have to take care of our people with the resources and tools that we have. And when we know that we're about to be left out, we have to pipe up and say, hey, you're gonna have to do something different. This is what equity would look like. And so we had scenarios where people had, were new to leadership where they had to push outside you know, and punch above their weight and basically be experimental, take risks and say the things that they might not have said um, had this not been the situation um, where they had to, they, they, they required their health department to actually look with an intersectional lens. So it's not enough to think about what was happening by race or what was happening by gender, um, but that there was a need to understand what was happening um, to women of color, right? And, to, to, and, and that's not only in terms of how the, um, the pandemic was impacting them and, and, and people, whether they got COVID, were dying of COVID, you name it, keeping data around that and sharing that data mattered, but then also being able to bring in resources um, to be able to meet the need. So that meant testing, because as we remember, testing at the beginning was very challenging to get. Yet we were being told, hey, get back to work or, uh, you know, our, our care workers were being told, get back to work. Um, and so you know, it, these are the things that I think happen behind the scenes that no one would see. But I also want to make the very important point that we are not having this conversation in the way that we're having it had we not had these people behind the scenes shifting the narrative. Right. So in the moment where people were saying we're clapping our hands for essential workers. Right, the, the, the video that was actually put out by the Ford Foundation where they said, well, let's clap back, right, against worker inequalities, against worker inequities. And that that clap back said, hey, before this pandemic, we weren't taking care of these needs, right? Currently, we're not taking care of these needs. And so whatever we build right now, we need to be building it to make sure that we're remedying the past and we're addressing what needs to be happening in the future. And so, these, you know, for me, this is the way that I get to have a touch for the things that are happening on the ground. Um, but I do want to lift up why it's so incredibly important that we have women in leadership positions, that they are able to bring their full selves, their authentic selves to these spaces and to these roles, because we start to see a very different kind of conversation and a very different kind of way of um, taking care of those who are most impacted um, and, and least protected. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, that's a, um, I, I have a few questions I wanted to follow up with you all on. And, um, you know, one of the things, and I don't know if, uh, I think some of you had the chance to listen to the um, Angelides lecture with um, Naomi Klein, and it included um, remarks from 
uh, Representative Jayapal talking about the National Domestic um, Worker Bill of Rights. And Rocio, I'm thinking of you in particular. Um, we know there are other policies that advocates have been fighting for that promise to raise labor standards and lift families out of poverty. And I'm also kind of connecting to, you know, some of what Cherie was just talking about. Um, well, actually, I think everyone touched on it. And that's, you know, people are left behind. And even when we have a standard or we have a policy, um, not everyone gets access to it. And so I was hoping or, or can access it to it. Um, I, I know what it was, Sheree, when you were saying, um, you know, if you're a member of a union, you know, it's, um, it, it's that we're, we're actually interviewing some workers right now about the implementation of New Jersey's paid family leave. And what we've heard um, where do workers get their information? So if they happen to be in a union, it's only the union. It's not HR, right? It's not HR. And even in, in, in other places, it's it's typically word of mouth. Um, unfortunately, it's not HR. Sometimes it's HR. You know, they have an important role also. Um, so I wanted to kind of get at, you know, understanding, especially since each of you do work that um, the type of work you do. So we have a National Domestic Bill, Worker Bill of Rights what is it, and, but this, the, what I've read about it, Rocio, is a little bit different than some of the other bills that might've passed or some kind of other labor legislation. And I wanted you to talk about like, what, what needs to go into that, both in the policy and on the ground to you know, be inclusive of workers. Like, cause I know it's not just about, I know when I was a union organizer, somewhere along the line, I learned that you know, collective bargaining agreements are worth the paper they're printed on, right? Like maybe they're worth that, that you need all this organizing behind that, the members need to be engaged in the union or else it is just a piece of paper. So I'm gonna stop talking, but I'd love to hear more about, you know, what's the thinking, you know, what's what's the kind of um, the energy under that? What are you looking to, to do um, with the national, um, with the uh, Domestic Worker Bill of Rights? Sure, um, as a, just a, to, um, as background, um, the Bill of Rights was actually introduced. This is the second introduction. Um, the bill, the original bill, was um, co-sponsored by by now our, our Vice President um, Kamala Harris and and Representative Jayapal. So uh, this is the second round, and obviously for obvious reasons, it didn't move in the first um, in the first session. Um, and the the bill has as um, some some changes. Um, but very minor. In, in essence, the bill continues to have a skeleton of basic protections, but also uh, mechanisms for um, enforcement. And I'll go into it in, in a minute. Um, but the bill is a reflection of over 20 years of advocacy. And it really um, is anchored in the gains that we've won at the state and local level. At this point, the Alliance it has supported the advancement of 10 state bills of rights. I'm about to introduce a New Jersey bill. Thank you so much for your support in the research phase that is really anchoring and addressing the comprehensive needs of domestic workers, in particular wage theft and how uh, when we talk about the care industry, we need to understand the intersectionality of the various um, um, constraints that affect, especially women of color, that you know they may be asking for PPE, but they are at the same time probably not getting paid everything that they should be paid. Um, and they are also probably not um, getting access to paid sick time or unemployment insurance. So the federal bill is taking the most uh, key and pressing issues that our membership, we have um, worker councils that have been established for the past five years, and they are set up by um, worker category or, or industry, home care, nanny slash child care, um, and house cleaning. And they, they basically voiced in many different ways what their priorities were. And so the National Bill of Rights um, is still um, striking exclusions 
Unfortunately, while there are um, basic protections already at the federal level related to minimum wage and overtime, the Obama administration uh, with the um, organizing and advocacy in the ground of many organizations was able to change um, and create a new home care rule that lifted millions of home care workers out of poverty by extending minimum wage and overtime. This just happened less than 10 years ago. So um, when we talk about equity, we need to really um, anchor it in the reality that some people just got the right to minimum wage and overtime at the federal level. Um, so the National Bill of Rights is going to strike the um, some of the existing um, wage and hour um, exclusions that impact mostly live-in workers. For those of you who, who um, may not be familiar, there is a growing demand of live-in workers um, as many more people are staying in their homes, in particular receiving uh, long-term care. Um, and live-in workers, not just housekeepers um, for people who are wealthy, um, but we're talking about living workers who are going to provide 24-hour care for seniors or people with disabilities. Um, so that's one aspect. The other big aspect is industry standards, things like meal and rest breaks, um, written agreements. Um, uh, let's see, I, I part of the team that, that drafted, most of it is industry standards, but we also have included enforcement. Um, and so this question of the distinction between uh, what are some of the rights and kinds of resources that union members get versus those who aren't able to get a union uh, collective bargaining uh, are things like a worker standards board. So our bill addresses the need to have um, basic labor standards with a mechanism to create that ability to sit with employers, and in this case, the Department of Labor, who we would be able to really pave the way and create um, basic standards that go beyond what the federal law um, at the moment is and at the same time would allow us to develop the leadership development of our members um, in this more comprehensive way. And some of these strategies are currently being tested in other jurisdictions. So Seattle's Bill of Rights has a standards board um, that we uh, passed over two years ago. Philadelphia's Bill of Rights has portable benefits for paid sick time law. And all of these components will be um, addressed and discussed hopefully in this, in this worker standards board. We're very hopeful and, and optimistic with the new administration, the leadership of the Department of Labor, especially with Julie Su, recently uh, uh, confirmed, who is coming from my home state of California and who understands how to basically address enforcement on a comprehensive and the role of government, right? And the role of having a partnership with community organizations that are in the ground directly addressing um, the specific needs of, of workers. Thank you. That it 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 feels encouraging, but I know it's a it's a lot of a lot of work. And um, thank you for giving us the context about how many decades this has been going on. And of course, domestic workers and farm workers um, were intentionally left behind, right, from uh, labor standards for a long time. Um, Miriam, I was wondering, um, you know, so in your community, um, our community, um, how has the legacy of undervaluing care work um, impacted the community that you work with? Um, and, you know, I was wondering, you know, and I'm also thinking and feel free to chime in on the, um, you know, this phenomena of wage theft, which, you know, in, in the groups of workers that the center has worked with, um, both, you know, my time at the Center for Work and, and in other hats that I've worn, um, wage theft is unfortunately all too common. Um, and we know it has an impact on family well, I, you know, I don't have data, but I'm sure it has an impact on family well being. Um, and kind of meeting basic needs. But I was wondering, you know, how, if you could talk a little bit about the legacy of undervaluing care work, how you think that's impacted communities you work with. Um, and then what, how do communities care for each other when policies and uh, 
politicians or government falls short? I know that was a few different questions. You can respond to it however you'd like. <laughs> I, I think that, you know, in the community that I work mostly of immigrant community, of course, um, we see a lot of the times that women that spend their life um, taking care of their children, of their parents, um, of their relatives, um, are not sure how, who's gonna take care, who's gonna have the resources in their own family so they can take care of them. I, I think I see that creates a lot of stress in a lot of the families. Um, and, and because there will be no access to SSI or to um, stimulus checks and none of that stuff, right? For, for many of them. And that creates a lot of stress in the long run for, for families, even families that do a little bit better. You know, I have my 87 year old dad that I bought with me from Puerto Rico after Huracan Maria. And it's a labor of love to have somebody at home. And, you know, there's the, the trail of people day in, day out, taking care of him. And that's when you really see the, the need of our, our people, right? Especially single women, you know, and the pandemic um, compounded many of the issues. I remember the one day me leaving for work and left the house. And the last thing I checked was, there was a five-year-old in my kitchen table, you know, going to school um, that she, you know, the mom is, 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 you know, taking him from one house to the other. And, and we had to have a conversation. I said, well, let me call the school, see what's in place. There was nothing in place in the school for these women. It was me raising the boys and many of the women raising the boys that the school then needed to make a list of places that they could have for you know, single moms that had kids and had to work because they didn't have any other choice to pay rent, um, to pay for food, um, that, we, that we could do that. So we see firsthand uh, that impact, but we also see firsthand um, how can communities get organized to, you know, New Brunswick has been an example of weight thefts and, you know, picketing in front of, you know, restaurants that they, they don't want to pay or contractors that want, don't want to pay the workers and, you know, they use social media and they use um, picketing outside the, and there's a number of, you know, immigrant organizations in town that have done a lot of that you know, let work yeah. to make sure that the workers are protected, that workers know their rights. And Rutgers, you know, has been supportive and, but that's not in every community, right? We need to expand that, that kind of work. Um, communities are resilient, immigrant communities are resilient. Um, they, you know, I, I, during the pandemic, we saw, you know, really thinking outside of the box. We have the one lady that you know, she saw that a lot of the kids were going out with no birthdays, you know, and going out with women going out with no baby showers. So she had this idea of doing baby showers on a box, you know, they, they birthdays on a box and she will collect donations and go and help that family. Um, and, and, and like that, there's many, many examples of ways that um, a, women will organize in this community, um, creating these huge safety nets am among themselves, which is critical for many of them, that they can call each other, that they know each other and they support each other when one is sick, when one needs food, uh, when one needs to be convinced to go to the hospital or call the police, right? Which is so important that they have that peer-to-peer -peer communication. Um, they create their own organizations through church, you know, um, they reach out to community based organizations to identify resources that they need. Um, and, and they support each other um, in times of, of need, like I, like I said. Um, so I, I, I think that at the community level, people have learned how to survive, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, and we need to support that kind of uh, initiative. We need to continue to engage that and be those, be that support, um, finding resources for them because sometimes with immigrant communities, they're not gonna be eligible for any other governmental system. So then we need to uh, think, think outside of the box to provide for those needs. Thank you. I, you know, I was just connecting some dots. I don't know if you all have. Um, so Miriam, so New Labor, which is one of the organizations in New Brunswick that has been successful in um, pushing uh, for wage and uh, 
getting um, uh, wage theft cases uh, successfully passed or whatever the right word is. But you know, they they've, had, they had they've sick, leave, leave, sick leave here before this day had sick leave. That's right. And, and I wanted to just also highlight that they're actually an affiliate of the National Domestic Workers Alliance yeah. and were one of our key partners in gathering data um, to inform the New Jersey. So I don't know if I, Rocio and Mariam, if you'd realize that, but I just wanted to connect some dots uh, there because I thought that was kind of fun. Yeah. Like it's a small world. Yeah. So, um, and Cherie, that this raises a question um, I have for you and um, you can certainly expand on it, but um, I think that, uh, you know, what is the role? So we're here and when we're thinking about the local and your work's national and global, which I forgot to mention in your bio, you're also working with global leaders, not just labor leaders, but other leaders of, uh, um, I guess, I don't want to say non-traditional, but labor, broadly speaking, right? Um, but what is the role? But we're in, in sitting here thinking we're, we're here at this university um, and it's right next to, and, and you know, it's, I remember, you know, when, when testing was scarce, but getting a little bit better, um, I know there was no testing and that that had to be a fight, which really is quite unfortunate that that had to be a fight because, you know, you think, oh, we're here, we're at the university, uh, we, we want to be supporting our community um, with, and, and that, of course, had to be a fight rather than just a, a given. Um, I wanted to get your take on, like, what the role of scholars, scholarship, you know, because I know there's, like, always this tension, right? We have, we're so fortunate at similar in the labor studies program, we have, you know, some scholar activists, and you're among them. And so I wanted you to talk a little bit about what you think the role is, what it isn't, um, and, and I'll stop talking. Yeah, you know, that's really, I'm, I'm glad you said that because as soon as you started talking about wage theft, there were a couple of different things I was thinking about. One, the working paper that my colleague Janice Fine um, worked on and, and has worked on in community with a number of different organizations, but specifically saying, hey, we, we've kind of been here before. What happened during the last crisis? You know, and going back and saying, oh, the violation spiked. Okay, so we can probably assume that something similar is going to happen. And, and I kicked in the gear doing research around that. And so, uh, you know, there's a working paper called Wage Theft in a Recession um, that came out February 18, 2021. But I also want to offer that, um, you know, being able to pivot is an extremely important piece. I mean, we had to mourn the shift. But the recognition that doing and being online opened up opportunities to be able to do things that we normally would not be able to do. Um, one of the things that I did was to reach out to my alma mater, Spelman College, and say, hey, we need a labor course, right? Like we need to put together a labor course. Um, and I worked with my colleague, uh, uh, Danielle T. Phillips Cunningham, Dr. Danielle T. Phillips Cunningham out, out of um, Texas, Women's University, and we put together a course called COVID-19 and Black Workers. And to our knowledge, it might be the only course at an HBCU that is focused, that centers Black women um, uh, in a labor studies course, right? And, you know, some of the things that we've been able to do were, were one is to speak to this piece around the narrative. Domestic workers have been shaping labor for more than a century, like, like as long as as long as there has been domestic work and there have been policies to try to improve labor, domestic workers have been shaping them, right? And so the problem is, is that oftentimes we don't know the lineage. We don't know the names of these leaders. We don't necessarily, um, um, they don't get celebrated on a holiday. Um, we don't see them, they don't show up in the frame. And so we actually spent time, um, actually I'm gonna lift up her book because it's Rutgers University Press. Um, but we spend time really thinking about what does an intersectional racial formation look like? Like what happens when you take the bodies of black and brown women and center them? What kinds of conversations do we now have around what it means to have protections, what it means to resist, what it means to be able to, um, to, to shift the way that you are conflated, right? Because we do have to understand that when we talk about care work, it's not just that it's conflated with women. Um, it is conflated oftentimes with black women, with immigrant women, right? It is, it is, um, it is uh, feminized in the way that makes sure that it's low wage work 
and that it is required essential work, right? That there's no way around it and that there's no supports. And so, you know, being able to teach this class um, at Spelman College online and to also recognize that the reason why Spelman even exists is related to a domestic worker struggle, right? Is related to the washerwomen's strike of 1881. Um, and so, you know, these having the opportunity to bring forward Jocelyn Fry's work, um, she she uh, put forward this argument again that we need to be um, looking at having an intersectional lens and talking about how this is impacting women of color, but not in like a big like a big category where everybody's lumped together. But here's how Black women are impacted. Here's how Latinx, Latina women are impacted. This is how indigenous women are impacted. Here's how Asian American women are impacted. And let's break that down even more, right? Because everybody can't be conflated. These are the types of jobs that they have. This is the type of pay that they have. These are the types of responsibilities that they have in their community. Now let's shape a policy that actually speaks to what their needs are, what their struggles are, what has been a struggle, right? How do we remedy some of that and put policies in place that make sure that as we move forward, that we don't like start to conflate people back into these categories that don't make people make sense. And so I, I think that the, the, the good thing that has come out of this is that those scholar activists who were ready to go, right? Like when I think of Jocelyn Fry, she's like former director of uh, policy and special pro pro uh, projects for the first lady, Michelle Obama, right? And so like for to have her on the ready, as soon as the opening to, to being able to talk about these things in the terms that it exists, to start putting this data out and making sure that we're shaping a very different narrative that is again, not a victim narrative, right? Like people are happy to take the, 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 um, the painful stories um, of care workers and to smash them underneath like as a bullet point to tell their, uh, their own larger story, but to be able to put forward the stories in their totality, to put them in their own context with the, the interlocking oppressions that they are dealing with and then to be developing remedies from that place, those who are most impacted, those people in the room, right? That actually is the thing that is going to move us to not only how we think about just shaping particular policy, but how we think about labor writ large. And one of the things that I'm hoping comes out of this is that we stop actually, it's fine to have a conscious approach to the types of things that women are dealing with as it relates to work, as it relates to care, as it relates to to their own conditions, right? But there are certain things that get conflated with women that are that are an everybody issue, right? Childcare is a labor issue, period. Most people cannot go to work. They cannot go to work and do their jobs unless they have the support of somebody who is uh, attending to their children, right? And so when we had the school systems actually say before the, the, the cities were shutting down, Oh no, we're shutting down. We have to shut down because we have to take care of these young folks. But here, we need to make sure we can feed them. We need to make sure we get these computers out to them. Like they're putting forth what the demands are and laying it all the way out and thinking about, we need to stop evictions. We need to put a moratorium on, um, on, on you know, all of these different things that we know are gonna be problems and we forecast what's gonna happen. And so, these, these are the ways that we actually have to foreground these things as not just women's issues, but there are issues for all of us. And that, that is actually the framing that we need to be using as we talk about what it means to take care of all of our residents. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's right. These are really, they're, they're everybody issues. Care is everybody's issue. And, uh, you know, um, oh, Rocio, did you wanna comment on that? Um, on, uh, let's see, I had a question for you. Um, um, so in terms of scholarship and, you know, I'm just, if you could tell me a little bit about, you know, NDWA's like the Alliance's relationship with um, scholarship in universities um, and what that experience has been like. Um, and it either barriers or, or uh, you know, how, what that's, you know, um, cause I'm, we're not always the easiest people to work with, I hear. So I was just wondering if you had, you know, um, 
messaging or something you want to share with with um, you know the university members of of this um, who are attending today. I I welcome the partnerships um, all the time as I'm hearing um, all of you, Sherry and Mary, and everybody, and 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 the 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 role that each we basically when we're thinking about a new uh, proposal have to think about. We're, we're coming into a community that our base is there, but in, as a lawyer, as an advocate, I um, am coming from social science as a sociology student, I see everything interlocking. I cannot do my job as an advocate if I can't support it and back it up with data and evidence, right? And so while our base of workers doesn't walk around thinking of these things in that framing and in that way, it is incumbent on, on myself and our team partnering with the folks who have the training and the tools to be able to help us figure out whether it's the, the inquiry, the, the, the research question um, that we often know very well because we know it directly from the folks who are experiencing it, but to be able to put it in a, in a way that's actually going to be uh, valid and seen as, as science that we can actually um, use it uh, for purposes of our um, you know, advocacy. It's absolutely essential. I have a number of projects right now, one with CUNY, one with UCLA um, Labor and Occupational Center, uh, you know, I, that's the only way that we as a nonprofit national organization can really be able to embark in some of these legislative and legal advocacy reforms because we need to be in sync and ensure also that universities are really accountable to the community. And I think the only way to do so is that that research is really grounded um, in the experience of the people who are directly impacted. And so as, an, as a lawyer, my, my job is putting people together, me being able to ensure that, that I am getting the, the necessary uh, research questions that are gonna help me make my case, right? But that it's really grounded even for myself from me having contact with the workers, right? And that comes from my own personal advocacy, whether it's in litigation or in negotiations with legislators who are asking very hard questions, right? And so I already know in advance that I am not gonna embark in a new um, legislative fight, like in this example, New Jersey, without knowing that we have you know data that really supports and grounds why I'm asking for those um, um, fixes and especially when we talk about fiscal implications right and most of the constraints that we have faced um, in state and local um, municipal work has been that the cities and governors say that's fine we will remedy the you know, the situation of domestic workers, but we just don't have money to be able to attach to this bill to be able to really make these rights meaningful in nature. And so the only way to do that is to say, actually, there's an intersectionality. If you care about health care and equity, you have to care about ensuring that your Department of Labor actually has the money to be able to address wage theft and discrimination and sexual harassment because these things don't happen separately they are interlocking yes Miriam, what's um what's been your experience uh with i know that we shared a um a workshop together recently um on research methods with marginalized communities or, or a way to engage marginalized communities uh photoshop right that we did um, I think that was in the fall, right? Um, it seems like a long time ago. Um, but I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how your work intersects with the university or um, research in the community, or if you're um, working on any projects that build capacity in the community to um, gather data. Oh, I think you're on mute for what we have, let's see. We are working with a number of research people in the community, and this has been a long process to find 
the ideal people working in communities to gather data. You know, you can imagine we sit in the city of where a huge university um, that needs to do a lot of research. And we always have said, you know, research needs to have a purpose. People need to get information back that is useful for them um, to continue to do their life. We cannot use all the money for research. We need to have some money for programming to address the needs that we have identified. So it's always been that struggle, but we have found ways to make research meaningful to many of our community or for many of our issues, right? We are currently working in issues related to senior health and how can we better engage seniors in, in that kind of work um, with, with the School of Social Work. We, we worked in evaluating many of our summer programming related to um, community violence. Uh, and this information has been very useful for us to continue to raise funds um, to, to get additional uh, programming. But of course, we need to have that perfect relationship Relationship between research and, and community, right? And people that understand the limitations that we have as a community and the need to provide that data back to us that is useful, that we that we can use. Um, I mean, we 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 love to work with our students, but you know, it's been a difficult year with not having students around um, because this a lot of this work is done um, in the community with many of our students, and we we really miss them. And 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 I think that to train them, uh, to train the students to do that kind of work is very important in communities of color because many of our those students are people of color to begin with that come come and they understand the experiences to work in cities like like New Brunswick and and other communities around here. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think that um, when I think about uh, um, research and I when I was in a a PhD program a long time ago, and I didn't finish it. I left to go to go uh, actually work for the the state, um, and it was the best move I ever made in some ways. Um, but I remember at the time I was really focused on um, trying to understand the the quality of uh, care and the quality of kind of working conditions or lack thereof in care work jobs. So looking at the fragmented care, like child care, you know, whether it could be family medicine. Um, uh, healthcare. And um, I had actually at the time, I don't know if that would be the case, kind of a hard time finding someone who um, like was that interested in it. Um, even at the, um, at the university at that time in the, in the program I, I was in, um, it wasn't in some ways, I guess, considered sexy enough or valued enough. I, you know, I think times have changed, I hope, um, since then. Um, but I know one of the things that we hear a lot um, in our department, and I think just you know maybe before the pandemic more, but this phrase, the future of work. Um, and the future of work often, I think, um, uh, means for people, I think they think about artificial intelligence. I think they think about whatever Jeff Bezos is doing, you know, robots. Um, and when I think about the future of work, um, and this is also something before the pandemic, we'd get reporters calling the Center for Women and Work saying, oh my gosh, women's labor force participation is through the roof, historic numbers. And, you know, we're like, yeah, yeah, it's great. But if you look under the hood, you know, you see that those job and that job growth um, is largely in care, which isn't a bad thing, but we don't value it. So the job growth was not like in good jobs, you know, good quality um, jobs. It's kind of low wage you know, women's work, that's where the growth was for, for women. Um, I, I Just my last question, and we'll see if the audience has questions, is like, if you dreamed, if you could dream a little bit here and you had like unlimited resources or a million dollars, which probably isn't even a lot these days, you know, what would you do, um, you know, to create a culture of care? So where would you invest? in this issue where we have this undervaluation of care work. Um, uh, but where would you start on building this culture of care where we have, you know, where we might have employers and unions and communities that are all um, 
uh, encouraging employees to take time off, paid time off to care for each other, where we value home health aides um, and don't look to, I mean, this is my vision maybe more, but you know, every time someone talks about the low wages of home health aides, they're like, well, we need to retrain them or upskill them. And I'm like, they're already skilled workers, right? We just need to pay them more and uh, not just pay them more. Benefits. But benefits, there's no benefits, there's no retirement. We're talking to workers, if any work, low wage workers, if they get paid time off, they're banking that. Yeah. They are not taking it, right? They're not, they're taking it it's they do not think about vacation the way we we take vacation at the university you know that's at least that's that's what they're telling me they get vacation very little vacation they get sick their employers are sending them to literally we just had a phone call with someone the other day they all got sick during covid they said we'll go on unemployment and then come back and reapply for your job that's how we take care of healthcare workers during a pandemic. But anyway, like what, what would, where would you start or where, what would be your kind of closing thoughts on um, where we could start to build a culture of care? Um, again, if resources were not, not an issue. Well, Sheree, do you start. want, oh, Rocia? Oh, yeah, um, I would say- And I know say, you have to hop off. Yeah, I have, um, I would say we have, infrastructure, we have social security system, we have an unemployment insurance system, you know, be it flawed. But the point that I want to make is that the fact that there are some institutional universal systems that recognizes that the government has a role in ensuring some safety net for its members is the key here. And I think we haven't even really come to grips and definitively come to uh, uh, really agreeing that that is one, something that we need to invest in. Um, and I would, I would say I would use my money to universalizing, ensuring uh, whether it's family medical leave that's embedded with paid sick time, just even that concept um, has to be really flushed out and expanded so that all workers, um, and the employers who are hiring don't have to worry about where the money is going to come from to be able to have somebody come to their home or, in this case, uh, care for their child or their loved one. Um, and that there's a system that's in place where they may have to make contributions, but the worker is going to be cared for and their loved one will consequently be cared for as well. Miriam, so so in other words, we have some structure already set up and we need to invest in that and make it work for everyone as yeah. a start, yeah. I have two things, right? I will say that um, like, like Rocio is saying, you know, I will in, invest in that safety net that is broken. It's broken, it has huge holes. Um, you know, like I look at hospitals right now and the new, the new changing culture is that they're going to screen people for social determinants of health. And that's going to create um, people going out into the community that need services, right? So we don't have that, you know, rolling door that people are coming in for the same thing because they have no medication, going to have a place to live, all of that. So we need to look at those systems that we can then now invest in our community-based organizations that, that they have been underfunded, you know, our health departments underfunded, you know, we really need to look at that safety net so we can make sure that we don't, people don't continue to go to these places um, looking for the same services over and over again. Um, I, the other thing that I, I have to say is that we need to push for a comprehensive immigration law, right? That we can not continue to have people in limbo forever. Um, so people can have decent jobs with better pay, with health insurance and benefits, um, so they can use some of these safety net that we're talking about, social security and unemployment and all of that. I, I want to pause before, sure, I, I have to jump off, but I really have learned a lot and I appreciate um, this uh, symposium. And um, yes, thank you very much for, for this opportunity. Thank you. It was nice to see you again. Thank you.
So I actually want to complicate this a little bit because rather than having just a conversation around investing, I actually want to have a conversation about where we need to disinvest. Um, mm -hmm. I'm right now thinking about Micaiah Bryant and trying to figure out if she had another number to call, if she had another phone number versus the police, would she still be here? And so when I think about the fact that Los Angeles, California has a five billion three hundred and four million dollar budget and that two billion seven hundred and seventy eight million of it is going towards the police budget then as far as i'm concerned there is a there is a way that we need to be disinvesting from particular ideologies um, of, of what it means to take care of our people and protect our people and redistribute that fund towards our hospitals, towards our schools, towards our social, um, our social safety nets so that people are making the phone call to the people who are actually gonna provide them with care. Um, and so I agree with Rocio, what Rocio just said about we have infrastructure. You know, I think about caring across generations who said, why are we being pitted against each other? My parents need care. These, we care about our caregiver, right? Like how do we get these financial um, industries out of the care business? Um, and we actually make it so we have the kind of system where those who need it can get it, right? right. Like right. in so many ways, we, you know, care is interrupted by our financial products yes. and the financialization of our systems. And so if we, disinvest in these things that are not actually providing us the supports we need and we reinvest our funds right our tax dollars our money into the places that are actually going to provide that support then i think we're having a different conversation and i want to be really clear like the the system isn't broken it's working exactly the way it was designed it was designed to exclude Right, and if we don't talk about the fact that it was designed to exclude, then we have conversations about reform versus having a conversation about what does it mean to have an, a fully inclusive, a fully inclusive system that is about taking care of people, taking taking care of people. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, those are great points, and we have a few um, questions. Uh, that have come in from uh, the audience. So I might just, um, I'll read those because I think that's the way we need to do this um, on the Zoom webinar format. Um, one of them is, um, and I'm sorry, I can't see who they're from. Uh, how can the media be mobilized more effectively to educate and connect communities about the realities of care workers and the ways they are leading change? It's a great question. Um, terrible one for me, I think, because I am like the worst at social media and any kind of media. Um, I, I think personally, social media, WhatsApp, Facebook is TikTok. what has moved our communities through all this pandemic. If you see behind me, we created our first Spanish speaking Facebook page for this hospital that has 12 hospitals. And it was a struggle, but we said this is the only way. Facebook Live has become the way of communicating with communities around here in their language. So I think social media is so important. WhatsApp, all that stuff that you know people are using to communicate among themselves and also with their families in other countries are, are key. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually want to offer that folks got really creative with media. Um, yeah. if, if, if in fact there wasn't a way um, through Twitter, through Instagram, through a number of apps that I can't speak to um, and I don't know, again, that we're having the conversation that we're having. When we started seeing nurses um, and, and healthcare workers taking pictures of themselves in trash bags and crying outside of hospitals, that changed the conversation, right? Right. Yeah. And so and so I feel like there, there's that piece, but then there's the other piece around, you know, yesterday I wanted to know, what, how come I don't have a news source um, that's national that looks like me? for to, to process yesterday and the day before 
right? And so there, there are questions about like when we think about media, representation matters and has always mattered. And there's a question around why you don't necessarily have more outlets that allow you to be able to see and hear from people who know you, who understand where you're coming from, um, and don't other, other you in the process of trying to deliver news. And so I, I think that there's a much more robust conversation that needs to be had around mm -hmm. like the kind of media that we really need to have and see. Um, and shout out to democracy now, but it's different, but still. Um, <laughs> and, and, and again, I also wanted to speak to the fact that people use social media in very, um, mm -hmm. like this know your rights piece, this, you know, how do you get access to support? Um, people were very creative in using these types of vehicles for spreading information, collecting information, redistributing, that sort of thing. And so there's something really wonderful about this. And I think we need to ha have a better sense of how do we utilize this so that we can put things in language that people need and, um, and be culturally, um, have it be culturally representative of yeah. the types of things that people need to hear as well. I think that um, I, uh, Rocio's gone, but I know that one of the, um, it's an app called Aaliyah, I think. Sheree, you might know more about it than, than I do, but Aaliyah is an app that, you know, they're using in Philadelphia. I hope I have this right, but this is, um, you can find this, you can Google it. Um, um, but it's the app that employers can um, contribute to so that if you have a cleaning um, person, a worker in your home, a nanny, that you can then add um, contributions to sick time, to vacation time. And I think that that's something I think about, um, and it's a good question for the Alliance, um, and we might be able to find it if you look at the National Domestic Worker Alliance in Aaliyah, and I know that I think the Rockefeller, I know that it, it had some funding, um, yeah. and th this is an innovation um, that allows, and that's the kind of thing that would be great to get out on, on media. You know, we have people at the university who have come up to us and said, gee, you know, I have a cleaning lady, right? Like as if this was, and I don't know what to do, right? Like how do I do this and do it the right way? Um, because we we like the work you're doing, Center for Women Work or the National D New Labor Domestic Workers Alliance. How do how am I not part of the problem here? And so I think that you know as there you know these are things that uh, some communities would really be receptive to um, and want to contribute. Um, you know, so it's it's important. So we, we can. Uh, I'm going to look that up later today. Can I just um, say that what you just said is actually one of the important interventions that was made is shifting from the future of work to the future of workers and yeah. thinking about the ways that technology actually can be used for the purposes of improving the conditions of workers' lives versus creating restrictions and making it more difficult um, or, or decreasing the, the work that people have. And so I think that actually really uh, speaks to that piece around the future of work. And yeah, thank you. And it in and, and monitoring, right? That's another way the future of work is, you know, monitoring things. Um, another uh, question that I think we still have time for um, is how, oh, this is an interesting question. Um, hmm, how can we promote the benefits of self-care within the community of care workers that are focused on caring for others? Um, so that's a, that's a great question. I know that, um, uh, Miriam or uh, Sheree, did you want to respond? I have I think, a response, but yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think it's important that we um, work with a lot of our women to deal with issues of stress. Um, you know, we have a number of programs here that we um, put together to make sure that, you know, they have that little time in their life um, to disconnect. Um, I think it's critical for the for their for for them and their families that our women can do that. You know, the hospital opened a fitness center, and we push for the fitness center to be something that people could afford, um, and that we were providing programming within that fitness center that was free of charge, regardless if you were a member or not. Um, and we made sure that programming was at night on the weekend. Um, we are doing. A Reiki and yoga and many forms of self-care that, you know, women talk to us about, you know, that they wanted it to do that they never had the, the opportunity to do, or it wasn't offered in the language that they could understand. And we had to like 
uh, get people that could do it in other languages. And those are very successful and we run a lot of those, um, but also doing things in the community, like we are sponsoring something called Ciclovia where people can get to know their, uh, their residents, walk on the streets, get to know the kids in your neighborhood, talk to other people, exercise in your community in safe spaces. We just open a new um, soccer field in the community and places for the community to come out and, and feel safe at and, and do you know, things outside of, of, of their homes. Um, I think it's, it's gonna be critical for many of organizations like ours to engage in that kind of work with the community. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I uh, really appreciate all of you being part of this panel um, and uh, hope I did an okay job as a moderator. You each have so much to say, so much experience. And, you know, I am hopeful that we will have a, that all of this um, anguish and um, loss and reveals of the last year um, will lead to a, a more caring economy and, you um, probably a lot more organizing um, will need to, to come along with that. But I really appreciate the conversation. Um, I think that we're almost at time. And again, thank the IWL for um, creating the time and space to focus on um, care, care work um, uh, this year. So thank you so much, Deb, and our outstanding panelists for this incredibly important conversation. I'm sitting here imagining the kind of world we could live in if we disinvested in broken systems, as you said, and invested in an inclusive system. And I am deeply moved by this conversation. Thank you all so much. I am going to right now introduce my colleague, Ethel Brooks. And we're going to pivot a little bit because Ethel is going to introduce Abena Bustia, and who has written a poem for the occasion. So this is an exciting moment. It is my pleasure to introduce Ethel Brooks. Ethel is chair and acting graduate director of the Department of Women's, Gender and Sexuality Studies at Rutgers University an Associate Professor of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies and Sociology. Brooks has been a Tate-trained transnational fellow at the University of the Arts London since 2012. She was appointed under President Obama to the United States Holocaust Memorial Council, where she served from 2015 to 2020. She is chair of the board of the European Roma Rights Center and the author of Unraveling the Garment Industry, Transnational Organizing and Women's Work. She's the winner of the 2010 Outstanding Book from the Global Division of the Society for the Study of Social Problems. Her current book project focuses on histories of encampment, claim staking, and Romani futures. Ethel Brooks will introduce Abena Busia. Welcome, Ethel. It is my honor and my pleasure to present to you today, my colleague, my sister, my friend, Abena Busia, who is retiring from Rutgers after four decades with us. Abena Busia is a renowned poet, a groundbreaking scholar, a committed feminist, an innovative teacher and a caring, committed and inventive colleague. During Abby's time at Rutgers, uh, spanning four decades, as I said, she was just talking about the fact that she's been with us for 40 years. She has built multiple fields, all of which are marked by her feminist work, her love of literature and poetry and her devotion to building research and teaching that deepen our understanding of African women's literary production across the continent and across decades. Working at the intersections of African studies, of African diasporic studies, African American studies, as well as literatures in English and women's gender and sexuality studies, Professor Busia has played an extraordinary role in creating multiple interdisciplinary academic fields. 
She has exemplified leadership and service as chair of women's gender and sexuality studies, as director of the Center for African Studies, and as director of the Mandela Fellows Program. And she has carried out her responsibilities throughout with grace and with generosity and with, with a beauty that she brings to everything that she does. As a poet, as a literary critic, as a filmmaker and as a feminist scholar, Abby has broken new ground, interrogating the politics of representations, particularly in relationship to women, to Africa and to blackness, teaching black history through poetry, theorizing black feminisms, recovering African women's writing and oral traditions from the 13th century to the present, and conceptualizing and publishing her magisterial four volume series, Women Writing Africa. We have been so fortunate, blessed and proud to have Abinibusia as our colleague, our leader and our sister. It is my privilege and my deepest pleasure to introduce Abena today. She's joining us from her home in Ghana and where from there, Abby will travel to Brazil, um, to Brasilia, as soon as it's safe again to travel, to take up a second term as the ambassador of Ghana to Brazil. No matter where she goes, no matter what she does, however, she will always be an integral part of our community at Rutgers University, at the School of Arts and Sciences, at the Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies and the IWL Consortium. So without further ado, again, it is, I'm just so happy to be able to introduce to you, Professor Abana Busia. I want to say what a pleasure and an honor it is to be with you again even if virtually from so far away. Rutgers has my heart. And so I'm always happy to be part of what you do. And I'm especially happy that you asked me to share poetry today. I've decided to share two poems. One I just discovered and one I've written for you for this occasion. I'll begin with a poem called Exposed by Sarah Bournes, who is a pastor of mission and formation at Hope Church in Midtown, New York. Exposed. We've all been exposed, not necessarily to the virus, though maybe, who knows, but we've all been exposed by the virus. Corona is exposing us exposing our weak sides, exposing our dark sides, exposing what normally lies far beneath the surface of our souls, hidden by the invisible masks we wear, now exposed by the paper masks we can't hide far enough behind. Corona is exposing our addiction to comfort, our obsession with control, our compulsion to hoard, our protection of self. Corona is peeling back our layers, tearing down our walls, revealing our illusions, leveling our best laid plans. Corona is exposing the gods we worship, our health, our hurry, our sense of security, our favorite lies, our secret lusts, our misplaced trust. Corona is calling everything into question. What is the church without a building? What is my worth without an income? How do we plan without certainty? How do we love despite risk? Corona, is exposing me, my mindless numbing, my endless scrolling, my careless words, my fragile nerves. We've all been exposed, our junk laid bare, our fears made known, the band-aid torn, the masquerades done, so what now? What's left? Clean hands, 
clear eyes, tender hearts. What Corona reveals, God can heal. Come, Lord Jesus, have mercy on us. That was exposed by Sarah Burns. Now my own poem that I've written for you. And I want to explain that it inspired, actually, I started it earlier. The opening is inspired by a picture I saw yesterday or this morning of an award-winning photograph of a COVID care nurse hugging through protective plastic an 85-year-old patient who was being touched for the first time in five months, reaching through to care. Through a curtain of clear protective plastic, its folded yellow edges shaped like butterfly wings in flight, a COVID care homeless, masked, gives a diminutive elderly lady, her gray hair nestled under the chin, her first hug in five months. That is the touch of love in difficult times. That charges our lives to ask, who do we care for? Those first sudden deaths in faraway places were mysteries, except no individual death is a mystery. Every loss is a story. Every statistic masks beneath the starkness of loss an ethic of care that counts, that counted, that will always count among the many thousands gone and still going. The next hundreds of losses closer to home were abysmal tragedies that left us floundering for stories to tell, of singing to inspire care workers from balconies above empty streets in the face of unbearable loss, to empower each other in the face of growing degradations and death. Until the following hundreds of thousands near at hand became a culpable performance of farce leading to this unspeakable nightmare of history we live through. When those who govern don't care or think they can bully a virus gone or their sheer bravura halt its progress, then it is the death knolls toll and toll and toll in the places they don't live and the corridors they don't occupy. Who do we care for in these moments of shock? How define a pre-existing condition we can't measure? or test on the body physical. How recognize and treat a pre-existing position we fail to register on the body social? How do we illumine the pre-existing morass we fail to confess on the body spiritual? What justice? do we care about? This pandemic is not the only crisis we face as we scramble to return all genies to their broken bottles and arrest the changing climate or keep fossil fuels underground. Can we measure our wealth in the social health that keeps bullets out of bedrooms, knees off our necks and the generations marching in desperation, chanting for lives that matter. 
how do we learn to take care? In volatile moments, those who lead make the act of care count. Then a compassionate people can survive to join the young, to embrace the change in everything and keep ourselves alive through improvising embraces as we get ready to dance and march and sing again together in the streets. Thank you, Ethel and Abby, for your riveting words. Abby, your readings sent chills of recognition, strength uh, for us to move forward. Thank you from the depths of our heart. So right now we're going to take a wellness break. I wanted everyone to know that we are going to show uh, Jordan Castile's painting Royal again during the wellness break in our slides that will be going uh, on during the wellness break. Uh, many of you asked that we see that again because it was up for a short period of time. We will also be showing slides of facts about women and COVID. We will continue our scheduled program in 15 minutes. So this is a chance to take a bit of a break. Thank you so much.
Welcome back. I am delighted to be starting the afternoon session, late afternoon session of our symposium. For those of you who are just joining us, the IWL Consortium's Symposium, Making Care Count, Care Work, Gender, and COVID-19. Welcome to our symposium. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing my colleague, Krishanti Dharmaraj, the moderator of the second panel towards a post-COVID future, Feminist Perspectives on Care. Krishanti is the executive director of the Center for Women's Global Leadership. She brings 30 years of experience working on women's human rights within the US and internationally. Krishanti is the creator of the Dignity Index, a tool utilized to end identity-based discrimination. Her vision and leadership made San Francisco the first city in the US and globally to pass legislation implementing an international human rights treaty to advance gender equality. Currently, this public policy strategy is being implemented in cities across the United States. She is a member of the governing body of the United Nations Spotlight Initiative, representing civil society globally. Welcome, Krishanti. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, good afternoon and greetings from the land of the Lenape those indigenous to New Jersey, where the Institute for Women's Leadership and the Center for Women's Global Leadership are housed. Thank you for making time for us and happy Earth Day to all of you. In July 2020, the Special Representative of the United Nations Secretary General on Sexual Violence and Conflict warned the United Nations Security Council against silencing the voices of those most affected. She said, diverse life experiences must inform policy, operational and funding decisions. If these are not gender-based in their design, they will be gender biased and exclusionary in their effect. No words could apply more accurately to recognize that the current pandemic is a gendered crisis and care and care work is central, not only to be recognized, but to be integrated into the ways in how we will move forward, including in how the economy would be redefined. When we look at care and the care economy, it is not only gender that we bring into the equation. It includes multiple and intersecting identities, such as ethnicity, race, class, caste, sexual orientation and gender identity, religion, ability, immigration status, and more. Unpaid care work, is inextricably linked to paid work that is both formal and informal, where predominantly women are multitasking both paid and unpaid work in all sectors, facing heightened levels of discrimination, harassment, violence, and even torture that has resulted in death, even at home. And this pandemic has made home the most dangerous place for women. We are privileged to be joined by three extraordinary women who will examine the future of care. And I am so proud to be a part of this panel along with them. I will start with Catherine Rottenberg. She's the Associate Professor in the Department of American and Canadian Studies at the University of Nottingham. She's also a member of the CARE Collective, a group of five activist academics who have co-written the CARE Manifesto. In addition, she's the author of the monographs, The Rise of Neoliberal Feminism and Performing Americanness, 
race, class, and gender in the modern African-American and Jewish-American literature. Catherine is a longtime social justice activist and is currently active in the UK's university and college union. Moving on to Melina Labukan Massimo is Lubicon Cree from Northern Alberta. Melina is the founder of Sacred Earth Solar, co-founder and just transition leader at Indigenous Climate Action and a fellow of the David Suzuki Foundation. She's the host of the new TV series called Power in the People and profiles renewable energy in Indigenous communities across the country. Malina holds a master's degree in Indigenous governance from the University of Victoria and with a focus of renewable energy. As a part of her master's thesis, Melina implemented a solar project in her home community of Little Buffalo, which powers the health center in the heart of the Tar Sands. Our very own Radhika Balakrishnan is a faculty director at the Center for Women's Global Leadership and professor of women and gender and sexuality studies at Rutgers University. She has a PhD in economics from Rutgers. She's a commissioner on the Commission for, uh, the Commission for Gender Equity in New York City. She's on the Global Advisory Council for United Nations Population Fund, UNFPA, and the current president for the International Association for Feminist Economists. I will begin with asking the same question from the three panelists. They will each have seven minutes and then we will move on to individualized questions. And my request to the virtual audience is please forward your questions via chat to the panelists. We will begin with uh, starting with Melina, then we will move on to Catherine and then Radhika. So my question to the three of you, or rather the first question is, when moving from a pre-COVID-19 careless economy, what strategies do you think should be used to ensure that care is counted? How do you share some of your, and can you share some of your thinking and work in kind of advancing this shift? Thank you. And Segwakia, Nia Malina Mio up in Labakan Mas one Nia Nihiao Kineskuntanawao. It is an honor and privilege to be welcomed into this panel. I am calling in from unceded Coast Salish territories of the Slewatu, Squamish, and Musqueam peoples. Um, I am I introduced myself in my language, which is Nihiao, um, also known as Cree, and I was born into my small community, which I'll go over a little story. I like telling stories to make these points, but I'm so honored to be here with all of you. Um, I'm going to share my screen now and um, hopefully that works okay in this in this day and age of, of COVID and Zoom life. Um, so here we go. So let me know if there's any issues, but um, so yeah, relearning systems of care. So towards a post COVID future, an indigenous perspective, um, an indigenous feminist perspective. Um, so again, my name is Molina and I work and founded both of these organizations with other indigenous women. And yeah, I wanted to make a point around the careless economy and the fact that the careless economy um, is connected to colonization and new forms of neocolonialism um, where we have de destructive careless economies based on colonial patriarchal values. I'm sure that's no surprise to this audience, um, but the one of the most familiar um, types of neocolonialism um, and us in the tar sands are as economic hostages are is resource extraction and having no choice but what we are surrounded on. To introduce myself, this is my cook my grandmother. Um, I was born into a small community of Little Buffalo. That's actually my dad who was hidden from the mission schools, the residential schools till the age of 10, um, where it was illegal and um, you would be jailed if you did not let your um, children be taken. And so he was hidden with my grandmother and grandfather for about a decade until they went. he went to day school. Um, so they both didn't speak um, English. They just spoke Cree my language. And so that's where a lot of my teachings come from. 
Um, again, this is where I'm based location wise here in the in the earth um, at the genesis of the tar sands, which feeds um, the global addiction and the, the shared addiction of North Americans, global addiction to oil, the US and in Canada. That comes from our home territory. And this is what it looks like from the air. Um, these are flyovers and biggest docks in the world. These mines are a size, as big as entire size of cities. Um, so as you can see, a very careless economy. Um, Imperial oil, for instance, is as big as Washington, DC alone, just one mine. There's several, several mines and a hundred different operations. Massive oil spills. I encourage you to look on oil on Google Khan land on YouTube, and it will talk more about this massive spill beside my home community where we had to breathe contaminated air, um, very much a toxic burden that we are experiencing cultural genocide and environmental genocide encroachment and contamination and destruction of our traditional territories result, resulting in loss of culture traditions and places and spaces to practice our ceremony and customs. And this is what the landscape is being replaced by, um, drained and polluted air and contaminated water, a very toxic burden that our families um, take on for the ability for people to drive cars and do all the things that we do with oil. And the impact is on what we're talking about today, you know, the cultures of care. And I want to talk about the culture of care in terms of an, from an Indigenous perspective, you know, because this is all over North America. This is not just one, it's a microcosm of a macrocosm of what we call Turtle Island as Indigenous peoples of North America. It impacts many communities, Black, Brown, and Indigenous bodies, um, fence line communities, cancer clusters, and all of the different associated impacts of being, um, um, in, you know, experiencing environmental racism. I also wanted to bring this point in of violence against the earth begets violence against women and the colonial values of patriarchy and capitalism, which exploit land and exploit women. Um, this is very closely connected to the murder and missing Indigenous women's pandemic um, epidemic across North America with thousands and thousands of murdered and missing women, um, including my sister Bella, who was um, found dead after she graduated from college in Toronto. Um, so it is no coincidence that our women are dying and our and the land is dying. This is my beautiful sister Bella, one of the thousands and thousands of murdered and missing Indigenous women that take that's happening across Turtle Island, so-called North America. So that brings me to what a just recovery looks like. Uh, we signed on as our organizations to the six principles for a just recovery. Um, you know, the sixth being right here, putting people's health and well-being first strengthening social safety nets and providing relief directly to people, recognizing the needs of workers and communities, building resilience to prevent future crises, which is very much connected to the climate crises and building solidarity and equity across communities, generations and borders. And then the last one I will talk more specifically on as an indigenous panelist on this panel is upholding indigenous rights and work in part in working in partnership with indigenous peoples. Um, and that obviously connects to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which talks about free prior and informed consent, which is not being upheld by the countries that have signed on to this declaration and continually see a violation of indigenous human rights across the world in North America. And we just saw another murder of an indigenous land defender yesterday in Colombia. So this is definitely not happening. Um, so I wanted to bring that international law to this conversation and talk about the critical paradigm shift that we need to have and that needs to happen. Indigenous peoples have a very intimate and reciprocal relationship with Mother Earth. And with that relationship, we have a sacred responsibility to protect her. And so that's why you see so many indigenous land defenders across the globe, across Turtle Island, um, protecting her, standing up, arrested, um, blocking themselves, chaining themselves, all of the things, or you see us in, you know, shifting policy, you see us, um, you know, I've joined many policy tables on climate uh, throughout the years. Um, so there's a variety of different ways Indigenous peoples are doing this work. Um, but because the Indigenous worldview is that all life is sacred, you know, when we're in ceremony, we say, when we end and start, we say, all my relationship is that in that all my relations in that sacred understanding of all life, all connection 
uh, to all beings. Um, and so I wanted to bring these other points of Indigenous governance actually having collective care structures in place pre-contact and now, and that's very unseen, very invisibilized um, in North America because the Indigenous issue is very invisibilized across um, this continent, unfortunately. And so, you know, I wanted to bring that in because we have always functioned as collectives through shared decision-making processes, structures. Um, you know, we had, did have matrilocal, matri uh, matriarchal systems as opposed to the patriarchal system of dominance that exists currently, which has put our earth so much out of shift and our society so much out of balance um, and we needing that shift. So we are out of balance at this point in time. And so Indigenous peoples have always also had systems of care in place, um, as well as the collective um, healing. So we have collective healing, not just self-liberation, but collective liberation, accountability processes, and also um, the system of distribution of wealth, and that comes in potlatch systems, redistribution of wealth through um, we call giveaways. Um, so there was these types of systems of care already in place and are still in place within our our, um, our governance structures. Um, a lot of times it's not recognized um, by the colonial state, but they are functioning within our communities. And I speak to that as a as, as a daughter of a chief who you know is is in. Um, and runs that way. So oh, it's having. So I'm going to talk really quickly in closing around empowering women and community-based solutions, in and what returning to zero waste communities are, which is our community's way of always being. Um, and so building these solar projects, putting them up. This is Carlton, who we trained to put up the solar project in our community, which powers our health center. And we had a solar feast, a solar launch, a ribbon cutting ceremony, and bringing in workshops climate literacy, energy, energy literacy workshops to avoid future pandemics like we are in right now and building sacred or solar and, and allowing indigenous women to take their place as inherent um, land protectors, water protectors and um, powering them up with solar, with solar um, technologies because that is the way we stand firm on our territories to assert the jurisdiction and the inherent rights of indigenous peoples who always have been caretakers of North America. It is no coincidence that North America was in pristine, beautiful condition because indigenous peoples were intimately connected and caretaking on that level. And that's what we need to bring back to systems of care. And so that's what I have to say. Um, also, here's power to the people. Feel free to watch it. And here's a way to get more information about sacred or solar and indigenous climate action. And I will pass it back. And so thank you so much for having me today on this panel. Thank you very much, Melina. We are uh, on to Catherine. Oh, but, <clears throat> good afternoon. Can everybody hear me? There's a little bit of an echo. Um, it's such an honor to be here. And thank you so much, Melina, for that very moving uh, presentation. And in the next few minutes, what I would like to do is to briefly take up this notion of a careless economy. Since in the work that I do, that I've carried out with the CARE Collective, and I'll say a few words about uh, the collective in a minute, um, we speak not only about a careless economy, but a reign in politics of carelessness. And this reign of carelessness has gotten us to our current devastating precipice. I'd also like to share with you the way in which the Care Collective has tried to imagine a different world, one that mobilizes this moment of global rupture to reorganize our lives, not around carelessness, but care. <laughs> So one of the strategies that the CARE Collective thinks um, is crucial moving forward into a post-COVID world is precisely imagining together and offering progressive alternative narratives of and for the future. So until really uh, recently, we had become really accustomed to dystopic visions and the CARE Collective's collaboratively authored CARE Manifesto endeavors to offer a more utopian one, what we call a feminist, queer, anti-racist, and eco-socialist vision. So just a very few brief words about the Care, care Collective. Does everybody hear the echo or is that just me? No? Okay. So it was created as a, as a reading group in 2017 
We were just a bunch of academics who are also activists in various social justice movements. And we wanted to come together to try to make sense of what we saw as the multiple crises of care already engulfing our world. The rising inequality everywhere, the refugee crisis and looming over everything, ongoing, ongoing climate change and environmental catastrophe. So after meeting for almost two years, reading, discussing, debating, and often disagreeing, we decided to write a manifesto, what would become the CARE Manifesto, the politics of interdependence. Of course, when we began writing in 2019, we could never have anticipated how grimly urgent COVID would make our manifesto. Manifesto, manifesto. keep hearing the echo. So in our manifesto, we argue that the current global crisis in which we find ourselves is indeed primarily a crisis of care. It's the result of histories and continued legacies of colonial, imperialist, misogynist, and white supremacist violence compounded by now decades of intensified neoliberal policies prioritizing profit over, over people. And we argue that if the pandemic has taught us anything so far, and let's hope it has, it is that we are in urgent need of a radically new politics that puts care front and center of life. And we have a few premises that undergird our vision. One is that building a caring world begins first and foremost by recognizing that our survival and our, and our thriving are everywhere and always contingent on others. Creating caring alternatives, in other words, involves avowing our mutual interdependencies and addressing the inevitable ambivalences at the heart of care and care, caregiving. And another key premise is that only by ensuring that communities have ample resources, infrastructure, and time can we create the conditions that render a caring disposition toward the other, however distant, ever more possible. So drawing on past examples and present manifestations of caring possibilities, Standing Rock and COVID mutual aid organizations come to mind here, as well as drawing on scholars, activists, and movements such as Black Lives Matter, the CARE Manifesto understands care as being necessary across every distinct scale of life. And so when we started, it was an in intellectual exercise. We asked ourselves, what would the world would look like? What would the world look like if the organizing principle were care? So in an effort to conjure, conjure up this world, we decided to look at different scales from the planetary through the, through the economy to the state to communities and to our intimate kinship structures. We begin the manifesto by diagnosing the interconnected nature of the current reign of carelessness. We travel then from the global dimensions that have produced the climate cri crisis and economies that put profit over people, traveling through to careless states, economies and communities, to how the banality of carelessness affects our interpersonal intimacies. But then we travel outward, scaling up from the interpersonal to the planetary in order to outline caring alternatives to our contemporary condition of carelessness. And we use this structure because we wanna show how our capacities to care are independent and can only be cultivated and realized by avowing these inextricable interconnections. So in a, in a nutshell, beginning with the most intimate aspects of our lives, our vision translates into reimagining the limits of familial care to embrace more promiscuous models of kinship, multiplying who we care for and how. It translates into reclaiming forms of genuine, genuinely collective and communal life, where caring communities are able to prioritize the commons, to create collective public spaces, and to encourage a sharing infrastructure. It means expanding de democratic participation and adopting alternative 
to capitalist markets. It means insourcing wealth, reversing the marketization of care infrastructures. And it means restoring, invigorating, and radically deepening many aspects of our welfare states, ridding them of all racialized policies and the sexual and racial division of, of labor. But creating caring states will require not only recognition of past atrocities, but also a reckoning with and multiple forms of reparation for genocide, slavery, and dispossession. It's only by co confronting the past and prioritizing the needs who have, those who have been most marginalized, violated, and negated by uncaring nation states will be, will be able to move forward into a juster, future and cultivate a radically different way of relating to others and the world itself. And finally, creating a caring world translates into mobilizing and cultivating a transnational orientation of care towards the stranger, creating porous borders and green new deals on the transnational national level. So in this way, the care manifesto develops the notion, a notion of universal care, which calls for inventive forms of collective care at every single scale of life where interdependence is avowed. So the vision that we offer is one where care is understood as our indiv individual and common ability to provide the political, the social, material, and emotional conditions that allow for the greatest possible number of people and living creatures on this planet, along with the planet itself to thrive. And I'm sorry if I, if I, I have this weird echo in my ear, I'm tearing myself at a delay. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, Radhika, on to you now. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, in terms of my intervention, I'm going to put my time clock on just so that I stick to my seven minutes. Uh, I think the first thing I want to, to say is that one of the, the real important aspects of this COVID crisis is that it exposed the level of inequality that already existed in our, in our society. And it kind of got put on television, right? I mean, suddenly we were watching people standing in food lines and everyone was sent home and the entire role of care in terms of the healthcare industry has been spoken about quite a bit, but it was not only a crisis of health, which COVID is, it was a crisis of care, both paid and unpaid care and a crisis of the economy. And all of those happened simultaneously. And, and too often people keep saying, well, we're going to build back better. But I think as both of you have already said, the back was never good. So we're not gonna, we don't need to build back, we need to build forward to a new kind of economy. And, and really this, this economic crisis is unprecedented. We've never seen anything like this. It's a supply crisis, it's a demand crisis, it's a healthcare crisis, and it's simultaneously happening all over the world. And most of the conversation today in the last panel and here has been, uh, looking at it in terms of a particular location, but it's also a global phenomenon that we need to address because if you do, I mean, the idea of contagion, right? This is a disease that there is there's contagion. And so if you don't deal with it at a global level, you're not going to be able to. So what, so I'll focus today because the last panel really talked about the care workers. I'll focus a little bit more on the unpaid care work and what the non-market, unpaid care work and what this crisis did in terms of exposing and really pushing for a need to understand it, which has always been there, right? And uh, I think uh, Pinar il and in the, in the panel this morning or whatever it was, I, I watched it yesterday, but uh, talked about the, the value of unpaid care work, right? It's, it's $11 trillion if we were going to pay for that care work or nine to 10% of global GDP. So as feminist economists, one of the things that we've been doing for a very long time is to say, look, you have to rethink what the economy means. 
right? It's not just the marketized, monetized version, which most, when people talk about the economy, they always only talk about the monetized, but what does the unpaid non-market economy do in order to sustain the economy? Because if you didn't have that unpaid, you wouldn't have the economy, right? So we've been trying to sort of do this work for a long time. And I think the COVID crisis kind of brought it all to, to uh, attention in some ways. But in terms of employment, uh, and this is just in the US and I don't know the numbers globally, but because everyone went home and who does the unpaid work at home, still predominantly women, the percentage of women who left the paid labor force has been huge. The number of, uh, the actual number, I, I, I don't remember, but it's 1987 levels. It's the worst labor force participation rates for women in 37 years, right, in the US. That just shrunk in the last year and a half. So then when you're coming home, so you have a choice between entering paid work versus unpaid work. What, what are you going to choose? If you, and most women, I think in the last panel talked about, don't have the choice. What are they going to do with their children when they're, the schools are shut and they have to go to work? And so if we're going to have a caring economy, what are the kind of things that we need to look at? We need to look at macroeconomic policy, which is something that we haven't talked about enough. You know, in the US, there was just this $1.9 trillion big, huge thing. How much of that is going into investment in care? Because as you invest in, in, in care services, it actually not only employs people in those services, but it also gives other women who can leave their children in care go and reach employment. So we need to look at macroeconomic policy. We need to look at, at uh, tax policy. Right. So much of this expenditure, the, the, the kind of deficit hawks are going to come very soon and say, oh, we can't spend this much money because it's going to cause a thing. But no one said that when we gave tax cuts of the same amount. So a feminist response is also a response to uh, addressing tax. Tax is a feminist issue. We need to look at social protection programs. And I think we talked about it a little bit in the last uh, panel. What are the kind of social protection programs? Uh, how many undocumented women have access to social protection programs? How many informal sector workers, and globally that's where a lot of women work, how many informal sector workers will be able to access those kind of social protection programs? So we need to rethink global social protection programs. We also need to think about global inequalities between nations, right? So the US can say, I'm going to spend $1.9 trillion on this and you know how many ever trillions on something else and the military. Most countries can't make that decision on their own. They have to go to institutions like the International Monetary Fund and say, oh, please give me some money because I have and already there was a study that just came out a couple of days ago that said that over 150 countries are going into serious austerity coming this year at a time in which what you need is huge levels of spending. They're going back to an old notion of neoliberal economic policy based on sort of balance of payments crisis and saying, no, 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 you all need to shrink your economy when what you need is increased expenditure on health, you need on, on care. So a caring economy is one in which we change what the economy stands for. What, what, does, it, what does it mean to have an economy? We all participate in it. I'm working on a project right now that's called, what's the economy for? And what if we say that what the economy is for is to fulfill rights, like the right to health, the right gender equality, uh, the, the right of, rights of indigenous people, the right to land, the, all of these things. And we put that in the forefront of what the economy is for, we would come up with a very different notion of the economy. And, and the, the other thing that I want to say, I'm just looking at the time, is that um, we, you, We've been living in, and in, in, uh, I think uh, you mentioned, you know, the neoliberal state. The neoliberal state has said the state's not, we don't like the state. 
They're not supposed to do the social welfare part of their job. They're very good at doing the disciplining part of their job, but that one's never stopped. But the social welfare part of their job has never really been questioned. Uh, and then and, and it's been shrunk and shrunk and, and suddenly COVID hit. Who's supposed to save us? The state, right? But who is accountable? Who's holding that state accountable? And how do we hold the state accountable to feminist values? Because I think that's where we need to go forward in terms of, of uh, policy is holding the state accountable to feminist values and holding the global infrastructure because I think we can no longer talk about nations isolated. We have to talk about global, right? And so what kind of feminist voice do we want to bring to multilateralism and, uh, and other things? I went over time, I'm sorry. Sorry, Krishanti. I, I get excited you. about these things. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I would have listened to you for longer, but we have limited time. So I want actually, if you can, to expand in, in our next section where we will have, you know, kind of individualized questions. So thanks, Radhika, and thank you to all three of you. I want to go back to Melina. And Melina, you spoke to this already. We in the Americas are on indigenous land, currently occupied land right, where issues of and the rights of indigenous peoples are often invisible. And I think it's purposefully and I think most would agree with that, right? Do you think now in this post COVID era that things would change and that we would actually hear about the issues and the rights of indigenous people, most importantly about your governance? Thank you. And you have about five minutes to respond. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, it is definitely by design that indigenous issues are left out of the dialogue and um, our discourse for a good reason, because it allows white supremacy to reign and it allows the ability for um, government states to have authority on land that is actually not under their jurisdiction. It's actually still under and should be under Indigenous jurisdiction as the original stewards of the land and actually the caretakers that actually know how to manage the land. You know, we see massive forest fires happening out West because of the inability to manage um, the fire, um, you know, the natural burnings that happened across North America to avoid massive forest fires. You know, there was a lot of indigenous management. And so that's slowly coming back. There's some co-management that's happening up here in so-called Canada, north of the medicine line. I don't know how much in the United States so much because I feel like in in so-called Canada, there is an acknowledgement more and more now of Indigenous territories, um, you know, and, and that's great. I think sometimes it can be lip service, but it's also, you know, people coming back to understanding their own history. Um, you know, it's, it's not just Indigenous history, it is the history of all peoples that make their homes on American soil and Canadian so-called soil. And I think that's such an important thing. And it, and it, I think it will only happen though, when other people, you know, my, I myself have been doing community organizing and awareness raising, you know, advocacy work for 20 years and, and I can do as much as I can, but it also, um, the responsibility is also on all people's shoulders. It's not just on Indigenous people's shoulders to teach the history of America and Canada to um, American and Canadians, um, you know, because a lot of us don't even actually um, identify as Canadian or American, we identify as Indigenous. Um, because our nation states pre predate um, the two colonial states um, where we where we live on now. And I wanted to make you know another point around frontline land protection um, that around unpaid work because I think you know we think of frontline frontline um, land protectors. So you know we we saw, we hear we see Standing Rock right now. Line three, there's been a three year occupation um, against the line three tar sands mega pipeline. There's been an occupations of indigenous peoples on their territory, asserting jurisdiction, um, and and this predominantly is unpaid work. And this unpaid work and or vastly undercompensated. And this unpaid work actually allows us all on planet earth to stay well and allows us to avert more um, catastrophic climate change. It also allows us to hopefully avert more pandemics in the future. Um, and it's so interesting that it's, you know, that this, this also isn't taken into consideration, you know, when we're coming up against 
this incredibly traumatizing work that when people are putting black, brown and indigenous peoples are putting their bodies over and over again on the front lines in direct conflict with the state police um, corporations and colonial states that have you know, exorbitant amounts of resources where we're, we're completely under-resourced, but yet we're still making that impact where you still see Standing Rock becoming an international phenomenon of people around the world coming to stand with the Lakota, Nakota, Dakota peoples um, in their territories. And I think that, you know, signal the change that people are, you know, no longer relegating this issue to, oh, that's just an Indigenous people's issue. No, it's a human issue it's a human being issue and I think that's what's so important um yeah so I think I really hope I have hope that it changes some days I don't have so much hope but some days I do have hope it depends on what day you talk to me um but yeah thank you for that question and I'll pass it back to you Prashanti. thank you thanks a lot um and Catherine um given the reign of careless economies in contemporary states nation states can you give more details about the CARE Manifesto in how it could be operationalized? <laughs> Hard to imagine at this point in history, but basically what we try to do in the CARE Manifesto, I mean, it really is a manifesto. It's a polemic, it's a utopic vision of, uh, of, of a future world. And, what we do is we outline what a, a state could look like if it were organized around care. Um, and actually we separate the economy, interestingly enough, into the, a, a different uh, scale because the economy it, it penetrates or that's infiltrates or is part of all the different scales. You can't uh, ex extricate. The economy from any of these, but any if in in any case, the the caring state begins with the idea that we need to change our notions or transform our notions of belonging. So the a state can only be caring if notions of belonging are based on recognition of mutual interdependencies rather than on ethno cultural identity and racialized border. So that's the beginning. Um, a caring state is one in which the provision for all of our basic needs uh, are taken care of and a sharing infrastructure is ensured, while at the same time participa participatory democracy is deepened at every level and the health of the environment is prioritized. So of course this means turning the current priorities of the state on its head on their head, um, as well as renewing, as well as transforming models of welfare and social provision. And we had a lot of discussions about whether the idea of the welfare state was what was, was adequate for a caring state. And what we in the Care Collective all ultimately came to consensus about was that public pr provision has to be based on what disability activists call strategic autonomy and independence, which is premised upon everyone receiving what, what they both, what they need to thrive, but also with some sense of agency in the world. Um, so we also believe that while the state is, is necessary at this point in history to ensure the smooth provision of services and resources, it also has to be responsible for facilitating greater democratic engagement among community, communities. So, I mean, in terms of what a caring state might actually look like would mean safeguarding affordable housing, along with high quality public schooling, public university education and vocational training. And I would even you know, say add universal basic in income and services. But I just read a really interesting article where they, they talk about uh, universal shared services rather than basic, uh, basic services, which I like. So in the Care Collective, we basically argue that by prioritizing a care-based a care -based infrastructure based upon recognition of our inter interdependencies and vulnerabilities, while ensuring all the necessary conditions for the mutual thriving of all, 
a caring state on a caring state undermines basically basically the conditions that produce economic environmental refugees and migrants. Um, and so there's also some re recognition. I mean, there is recognition. I, it's so hard for me with the with this echo because I hear myself and then there's a de delay um, that no state or even any community can ever completely eliminate human aggression, relations of domination or natural and human made disasters. But what we were really trying to think about are what are the kinds of conditions that would enable the vast majority of people living living within the domains of this caring state to flourish. So that's the, the ways that we began outlining a template without being too prescriptive, we, we hope. Thank you, thanks a lot. Um, we, we touched on this, Radhika, a little bit when we were talking about inequality and, and how, you know, um, COVID has really amplified it. And I want you uh, to know, uh, I want to know if you could elaborate further on how structural gender-based discrimination contributes to this discussion on care and also the increase of violence against women that we uh, see. I mean, you know, the, system, the systemic inequalities that have existed, uh, are due to systemic discrimination and certain kinds of gender roles and 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 you know we, we can go back in history and talk about colonial constructions of those uh, but not just gender but race ethnicity disability and all of those are 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 um, in, at play and so I thought you know to to answer that question Krishanti I thought let's just take a couple scenarios and then see what comes out of those right so uh the covid crisis happens people are sent home suddenly everyone's inside the house uh, maybe one or two of the people who were earning money are earning less money there's less household income and you can't leave right you can't leave and and in those instances and you know the data is there the the increase in uh gender-based violence in the home just skyrocketed all over the world, right? So what, what happened? Was it because suddenly everyone got violent or were the systemic inequalities within the household and power dimensions that, that existed that this compounded? You couldn't leave the house. Maybe you lost your job. You don't have money to go out. Uh, domestic violence centers are shut. Governments are not increasing spending on those on those centers or giving ways for for mostly women to access resources to be able to go there. Um, and it's not only during COVID. I mean, I remember in after the 2008 financial crisis, I was traveling in Spain, and one of the places that the cut the budget cuts were in funding domestic violence centers, and so. Women had lost their jobs. They were sitting at home. They're in a violent situation. There's no childcare center where they could leave their kids and go and get help. So, you know, those are all existing inequalities that are systemic. And then what this does is compounds what what that what what happens to that. And then within that, you know, access to any kind of services depends on where you are located in the economy. Right. So do you have access to services if you are an undocumented worker in the U.S.? And I'm thinking also globally, you know, the informal sector workers, where do they go? I mean, I, I'm sure all of you have seen the, the crazy videos of the migrant workers in India having to leave cities and go back. Uh, that's based on inequalities of those people in those situations right it's just i think what what covid did in some ways was it televised what was already there and somehow everyone started paying attention you know it's like okay millions of migrant workers well where did they sleep before uh, i don't think most people have even thought about that uh and then what is the level of violence that they're dealing with as they're you know moving uh what kind of protection they were sleeping on the streets where, where do women be safe when they're sleeping on the streets so your question is that, you know, is, is, is it based on systemic discrimination and power and inequality 
that already existed? Absolutely. And what this did is compound it. And now, you know, moving forward, how do we recognize this? And what are the kind of policies we need to put into place in order for us to, to deal with these kind of issues? You talked about the violence of, uh, you know, and, and in indigenous communities and, and the murder of so many indigenous uh, women, your sister, I'm very sorry uh, to, to hear it. How do we take that information? That's based on systemic discrimination, inequality, power dynamic. We all know it, but I think what we need to do is, is to really come together and envision what kind of world we wanna move forward with. And, and if there was ever, I, I keep saying this, if there was ever a time, at least in my lifetime, that we need a new vision, it's now. And, and, and I think it has to be a feminist vision. Uh, I, don't think, I don't think it can be anything but a feminist vision. Thank you. Sorry, I'm waiting for some questions to come through. In the meantime, I, I want to go back to you, Melina. Um, in a way, when you started speaking, you kind of turned the question of, uh, like the term care, I think, um, the other way around. Because when you started talking about land, right? Uh, and how, in that case, how the indigenous community really uh, thinks about care perhaps is different. Can you speak to that, please? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting too, because at the beginning of, I put a indigenous, a feminist perspective and they're they're actually synonymous. So, so a lot of times indigenous peoples don't call ourselves even feminist because um, indigenous, is indigenous governance systems and structures and connection to land and the way that we see the earth is we call her mother earth. And so there's this sacred feminine connection in this, in this. And so why I talked about the needing for a paradigm shift is bringing back that rebalance in those ancient views, ancient wisdom traditions that existed, you know, not only here as indigenous people in North America, but, you know, across the world. And so I think that is that um, rebalancing that we're coming back into the sacred feminine and that connection to land as our earth mother and the fact that we are a part of her. And I think the, the thing with patriarchy and, you know, this careless economy of capitalism and neocolonialism and neoliberalism is that we are on this pinnacle of just like this hierarchy that exists in this world where we see humans somehow at the top, which is, which is so um, just like such a foreign concept for Indigenous peoples that see the sacred hoop and us being a part of the sacred um, view of being one of the many of um, you know living beings that that coexist here on on planet Earth, and we are not the dominant, and nor should we be the dominant, um, you know, structure and force of the world. So that is that inclusion and you know that that rebalancing and sacred view of um, coming back into harmony with Mother Earth. And Indigenous peoples have always had, had that. So we you know that's why you see us on the front lines. That's why you see us alar raising the alarm bell for climate and all of the things with you know with other climate scientists. But um, we just we really I think I we talk about I talk more publicly now about sacred view to you know to show and hope and invite other people from other ancient traditions that maybe have been severed from them to to reconnect with those 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 um, natural laws and those truths that we really do exist under natural law um, not under you know some um, human um, propagated human made economy that's such a falsity you know we need to return to natural law to be able to live in in coexistence and um, caretaking of her thank you Radhika I want to go to you next there's a there's a question that uh, in the chat uh, what do, what would or could a macroeconomic and fiscal policy look like in a caring state uh, yes yeah. I, I, I will answer that, but I want to just uh, jump for a second uh, to piggyback on Melina's uh, uh, comment. If, is that okay? Uh, sure, go I, ahead. I'm all excited about this because, uh, you know, one of the things in, in economics is the, the judging of an economy is based on GDP growth, right? Which the relationship between growth and the natural environment, we all know it's called climate change, right? <laughs> And so there's a whole bunch of, of new uh, thinking on making well-being 
the 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 way in which you you generate uh, an idea of the economy. New Zealand, many other countries are trying to look at this well-being, and the OECD actually has a whole bunch of indicators on how to judge an economy by well-being. Well, one of them that I've been uh, working on is in uh, in Ecuador and Bolivia. Uh, they're taking the idea of well-being and calling it buen vivir, which is the good life, but uh, translated in Spanish as good life, but I think it's from Quechua that means something much bigger, which is the good life for the planet, right? And that it doesn't make the person in charge of the planet. And, and so there's just some really interesting things on buen vivir, and, and there's some criticism about it as well, but but um, but I've just been thinking about it. So when I heard you speak, I was just like, wow, I, the, we, we need to get together and talk some more. Uh, in terms of what are the kind of macroeconomic policies that we need to look at? Um, you know, we need to look at macroeconomic policy in terms of its relationship both to the market work and, and the non-market unpaid work. And, and I'll give you just a very basic example. So. I just talked about the level of austerity that's going to take place around the, the world where people can't borrow the money that they can. Well, when austerity hits and you start cutting education, healthcare, you know, all the kind of things that, that austerity uh, programs cut, who takes up that burden, right? When, when your, your school programs are closed and the kids are coming home, what, who takes care of them, right? If someone is sick and there's no healthcare provision, it's 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 assumption the assumption that basically women's unpaid work unpaid work is just in, infinitely elastic you know so we actually end up taking the burden of macroeconomic policy so when there is the so what what i would say is that one of the things that we need to look at is spending policy has you have to increase spending policy and we need to increase spending policy that looks at care, right? I mean, that looks at, at, at infra when we talk about infrastructure, care is an infrastructure, right? It's not, it's not something you waste, it's something that you build. By building in a caring economy, uh, you're actually building uh, new, new ways of living. Uh, the UK Women's Budget Group, uh, and I wanna plug this, is they've come up with this great, you know, a caring economy, a kind of, it's not a manifesto, but more like a government policy prescription that they actually say, what are the macroeconomic policies that we need? And Ipek Karachin, who spoke on the, on the panel earlier on, and, and she's built on that work of the caring economy and she's included the environment and saying, how do we take the destruction of the environment into the way we look at economic policy, what she calls the purple economy? And, and how do we, in the same way you talk about green economy, how do we put green and care and feminists together? And, and she's coined this term, the purple economy. So I think looking at macroeconomic policy from the caring side gives you a very prescriptive sense of what kind of, you know, tax policy. We need to tax like crazy amount of tax of the people who are polluting and, you know, I mean, what? Five people made more money during this COVID crisis than they ever did before. I mean, that's unconscionable. I mean, that's ridiculous when people are standing in food stamps. So we need to have a redistributive economy. We need a different tax structure. Uh, we've had 30 years of neoliberal uh, economic policy and you know 20 years of financialization. Well, it's got to stop because it's not working. It's not working. And at some point, what island are they all going to live in? you know, with their Maseratis. They can't all live on this one island where they're going to have to interact with the rest of us at some point. Thank you very much. Uh, I have so many more questions on that, but I am now going to Catherine. Um, so the, the question is like, this is a stimulating conversation and this is a reminder of the need to change our education systems and curricula. Can you speak to some examples of how this, this is happening or, you know, this could happen? So it's really interesting that the question is around education because it's one of the things that in the manifesto that we actually didn't go into much detail, um, but it, it's one of the things that I've been very involved in here in the UK. And I don't know what's happening 
quite so well, so quite so well in the US at the moment, but I know that in the UK, the education system is in crisis, and that's particularly true of the higher higher education uh, higher education sector. Um, and that what we're seeing is not only the neoliberalization, but also this managerial uh, bureaucratic uh, apparatus, which is destroying not only academics, freedom of act, freedom of speech. Um, but also any sense of, of, of education as kind of an intellectual, curious, curious, uh, critical thinking. I mean, so I think one of the things that we're fighting for within the union in the UK is to change governance structures. Um, I mean, with, we're not even trying to deal with the government bailing out the, the, the the universities because with the Tory government that's not going to happen but we're trying to work within these institutions and transform them from within um, and that begins with uh, democratic governance within these institutions um, and of course thinking about curriculum uh, we need completely transformed curriculum which is not only decolonized but also is actually encouraging critical thinking, good reading skills, good writing skills, however we define those at a particular moment in time. But also, of course, we, we need to completely rebuild public education from the, from the ground, from, you know, nursery, free, high quality nursery, from zero to secondary and, and higher education. I mean, that's the beginning where you have the resource and you have democratic governance and, and yeah. And that is gonna be a very, that's gonna be an up a hill battle, especially here in the UK. You're on mute, Ashanti. Thank you. Thanks a lot. So um, thank you very much for the round of questions that you've gotten. I have uh, one question that I want like a one minute answer on from the three of you. Um, and that is in relation to women's leadership. Uh, so there's much conversation about women's leadership, uh, the formal leadership that is structured within a patriarchal and a colonial frame. How do you think women should exercise leadership to shift the discourse on care? Is there, is there a difference? And what you know? What are your thoughts? And a quick round uh, of uh, you know a one minute each. Thank you. You who do you want to go first? Um, sorry, I'll start with you, Radhika. Okay. <laughs> um, I would say. I mean, I actually would not say women's leadership. Uh, I would say feminist leadership because uh, I, I grew up in India with Mrs. Gandhi as the prime minister. And so I think just having a woman doesn't, uh, I, you know, it's gotta be feminist leadership. Uh, and so I think feminist leadership is really critical. And we see when we do have feminist leadership uh, and, and what difference it makes. And it kind of piggybacks on the question that Lisa asked about education, you know, and this is me personally, how many economics departments have feminist economists? I can tell you in the US it's three, you know? So we need, to, we need to talk about sort of how do we get feminists in disciplines to teach so that there's a whole change in the, in the structure of, of thinking uh, so that you're not sort of this outlier, which is what we are. And most of us are not in economics departments. I mean, that's my own prep pee, but I, I would change it from women's leadership to feminist leadership. Thank you. Um, Catherine? I completely agree with Radhika. I, I do think that, un, that fortunately or unfortunately, often feminist leadership and women's leadership are intimately connected. Um, and I, I also think that one of the things that I've learned through my social Justice activism is that the, whatever kind of leadership, feminist women, it needs to be collaborative and and coalitional, and that's how we are best able to move forward. 
Thank you. And uh, Malina? Sure. Um, for me, I think in this call, in this conversation, a culture of care, so it is uplifting women in all of their respective works. I think there's an underlying insidious patriarchal value that often takes over um, women's leadership um, that does undermine other uh, ways of you know collaboration, like Catherine said. And I think we need to really look at um, ways of healing as well um, from patriarchy. Um, and also healing um, black, brown and, and indigenous bodies and making that a priority too of a culture of care. What does healing justice look like in this work as well of healing from white body supremacy? And I really wanna lift up like Resma Menakem who I think is just such an amazing black clinic, clinical scholar and therapist who talks a lot about how racialized trauma is a huge thing that we need to address in our society. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, we gave you a curated set of questions and I want to just open up and just let uh, the three of you speak on anything that you want for the audience to know, uh, either about your work or about a comment in relation to care. Uh, st starting with you, Radhika. Um, wow, well, I, I wasn't expecting that, so I didn't quite have my head together. Um, <laughs> just you. Just anything. Uh, I mean, I think I think the issue of care. Uh, I think I think yeah. This is what I'll say. I think everyone is sort of jumping on this thing of care, and one of the things that I worry about is that then the way in which care is understood is at its minimal, you know. And so uh, there's a whole bunch of foundations coming together who want to fund care. And so then they're going to give money. I mean, and, the, and I think this is money that should go to domestic workers, organizing, unionized, you know, healthcare workers, uh, increasing all of that, all good things to do. But that isn't going to end gender inequality, right? I mean, and, and I, I worry about that. I worry that it becomes sort of at the micro level that if we deal with, care workers and give care infrastructure, then we'll have gender equality and not look at the kind of economic, macroeconomic issues, the, the issues that you brought up that, that you know, is at the root of capitalism. Uh, and, and obviously I'm not asking donors to undermine capitalism. They wouldn't exist if they didn't have it. But, but I think we need to be careful when everyone is jumping on this idea of care that it doesn't become brought down to its lowest denominator, right? I mean, yes, care workers should get a lot more money. They should be unionized. All of that, I agree. But that's just one aspect of what is wrong with power and inequality in our, in our society. And, and, I, and I worry that as I see, I mean, as someone who's been talking and writing about care for 25 years, it's exciting that now everybody wants to, you know, feminist economists are the, the cachet right now. But it, it, I don't want to see it get diminished to uh, making sure that care work, that only, that it's only not only about care workers, but that it's the overall structure that, that we need to really re-envision. And how do we re-envision that from a feminist perspective? Thank you. I think what you're really uh, asking funders as well as all of us to do is to really look at the root causes and structural change. Uh, and I think there is a way in which funders look at return on investment differently. Uh, <laughs> so I, I, I think that that is a challenge that you have really opened up. Um, Catherine, going to you. So I Again, I absolutely agree. And one of the things that we try to do in the manifesto is precisely move discourses of care away from not only hands on care, but thinking about care as an organizing principle and how, how that organizing principle would operate at different scales. And it looks different. And so the kind of definition that we open up in terms of universal care, we don't close it down. Um, is one that tries to think creatively of what care would look like from the interpersonal to the planetary. But I also wanna say that care is in the air. And I think that that's both um, an opportunity, but also it could be a trap in the sense that it becomes 
it becomes oh, bad. It becomes what we call in the care manifesto, care washing. So corporations jump on and they say that they care. And I think one of the things that we would posit as a care collective is that in contrast to calls for liberation in the 60s and the 70s, care has become the key, key, key problematic for politics today and not just for politics, but for, for economic, ec economists and for social justice activists. Thanks. And on to you, Melina. Sure. Um, for me, I guess what I would like to say to close is, um, yeah, we were talking about going at the root causes of the issues that we're talking about today. So for me, that's actually the decolonizations of our minds, bodies and our spirits. And so that's for me, what I see is, you know, we see this like self-care movement, which is, which is definitely individualized again and corporatized and capitalized through this like thing of like, I'm going to meditate and be in a room by myself. And so therefore that's how somebody changing the world. And that's not, you know, we know that self-care is connected intimately to collective liberation, collective care. And so I think it needs to go away from the individual to the collective. And that's why for Indigenous peoples, that's what we call decolonizing. And so for me, that's, that's a big thing to take into consideration that I invite everyone here today to decolonize to the best of your ability um, as people as settlers on stolen land and understand what that means and what that is and yeah I also put in the chat here please for more resources around Indigenous sovereignty and how to support that go to sacred earth thought solar go to indigenousclimateaction.com or power to the people.tv and you can learn more about these things that I was talking about today so hi hi thank you so much for having in this conversation it's an honor to be on the panel with all of you amazing women uh, thank you to the three of you. You've been amazing. And this conversation has really enriched the really the, the continued conversations on care and how to think about it and how to reevaluate and what moving forward uh, might look like. In closing, I just wanted to kind of um, really thank the three of you again uh, for being here, for your time, for your thinking, and for your passion, and what you do on a daily basis. Um, we know that until women are valued as human, the women's labor will not be valued as full and equal contributions to an economy uh, or to this world in the current context. There will be no building back better or building differently um, and really moving forward unless women's experiences within their multiple and intersecting identities are recognized and integrated into social, political, economic, and cultural spheres that we aim to influence. The new and improved normal is not only about uh, kind of building back better and really thinking about care in the current way we have been engaging, but it is also about living better um, in harmony with the environment. And for this, women's work has to be valued. It has to be integrated and our contributions should be recognized as partly as massively as possible as it's fundamental to the well being and the sustainability of people and the planet. So, thank you very much. And over to you, Rebecca. I want to take a moment to pause and just thank Krishanti and your outstanding panelists for this paradigm shifting conversation. It is hopeful. It's breathtaking, it's frightening, but so necessary to think of a feminist vision of care, a society based on a good life for the planet, changing Earth Day to an everyday commitment to a green economy, a purple economy, and a sacred relationship with our Earth. Thank you very much. In closing, I have my most profound thanks to all our moderators, moderators and panelists. I am proud and honored to represent the IWL Consortium. I think 
we have just entered a conversation that will reverberate and create change for years to come. If you have not already, please be sure to watch the pre-taped conversation with Naomi Klein, Pramila Jayapal, and Ipek Ilkarjan. You can see the link in our chat. There are so many people who came together to make this symposium possible. Too many to mention individually. But I would be sorely remiss if I did not call out two people who went above and beyond, Emily Heron and Kylie Davidson. We are grateful for their many, many, many hours of work. On behalf of the IWO Consortium, I want to take this last moment to ask you to reach deep into yourself and put into the chat one change you will make in your life, at home, at work, in your research to value the full meaning of care. Let's share who we are and share what we're thinking of doing in the chat. And during this particular week, this particular month, this particular year, I want to end with the words of Bernice Reagan of Sweet Honey in the Rock. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. We who believe in freedom cannot rest until it comes. Thank you and good afternoon.